Here. Commissioner Woodham? Here. And Chairman Solomon? Here. Uh, we have our American flag there, which is really great. So we'll stand and do a salute to the flag. And begin. Pledge of allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag. To the United States of America. America. To the Republic, to the Republic, Republic for which, which it stands. stands. One nation. One nation. Under, under God. God. Indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty, liberty and, justice and justice for all. We need to work on our timing. <laughs> Tark, you start, you kind of listen for the feedback and then you. <laughs> I think it's inter you internet, internet delay is part of it. It's a little bit of a harmony. Yeah. Well, we're not going to be uh, starring in any uh, seven person band anytime soon. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, our order of agenda tonight. Uh, does anybody want to make any changes to the order of agenda? Seeing no takers, I'll ask for a motion, please. And during the meetings, the way that we're handling them now, we'll uh, do a verbal motion with a second, and then we'll do a verbal roll call. Do I have a motion to approve the order of agenda, please? So moved. And we have a second? Second. We'll do a roll call to approve the order of agenda. Uh, Commissioner Samples? Uh, aye. Commissioner Chung? Aye. Commissioner Woodham? Aye. Commissioner Wynn? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Thank you very much. We do have one blue folder item today. Uh, we came in from uh, staff. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the uh, blue folder item that we have? Any takers? Uh, motion to approve. Thank you. Uh, do we have a second, please? Second. All right. Uh, I'll take a roll call vote to approve the, approve the blue folder item. Uh, Commissioner Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Wynn? Aye. Commissioner Chung? Aye. Commissioner Woodham? Aye. Commissioner Samples? Aye. And I vote aye as well. Okay, we don't have any, um, we have two items on the uh, consent calendar tonight. We have the uh, approval for affidavit of posting. May we get a motion to approve the affidavit of posting, please? So moved. And a second? Second. We need to go through a roll call vote there, Eleanor? Well, no, you have two items on consent calendar. You have um, the affidavit and you also have the minutes. And then also uh, we have no e-comments for that, that section. Okay, thank you. Uh, so are we able to approve them both uh, at the same time? Yes. Very well then. Would anybody have, before we do that, any changes to the uh, minutes from the previous meeting? Any changes or comments? Then we have the motion to approve items F1 and F2 on the consent calendar. We have a motion and a second. We'll do a roll call vote, please. Uh, Commissioner Samples? Aye. Commissioner Chun? Aye. Commissioner Woodham? Aye. Commissioner Wynn? Aye. Commissioner Johnson? Aye. And uh, I vote aye as well. Uh, we don't have any items on the excluded consent calendar. Uh, we have next our public participation on non-agenda items. This is an opportunity for members of the public to comment on items that are not listed on the agenda. Sections limited to 30 minutes. Each speaker is afforded three minutes to address the commission. Each speaker is permitted to speak only once or submit one comment in this case. Uh, do we have any public comments on non-agenda items, please? No, we have no items, no e-comments. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's please move on then to items continued for old, from old business, which we have none, which brings us to items for discussion prior to action, new business, a continuation of our discussion from the previous meeting, discussion and possible action regarding the fiscal year 2021 city manager's proposed budget, the fiscal year 2025 City Manager's proposed five-year capital improvement program. Uh, Marnie, did you have a, a presentation for the capital improvement program? We do. 
So okay. uh, we um, do that first, and then we can get to the questions on the operating budget that were submitted. That's great. Thank you. Go ahead and um, share my screen for the PowerPoint, and then Michael walk us through it. There we go. There we go. Great. Thank you, Marty. And uh, formal introduction, uh, we all know each other. Mike Witansky, Assistant City Manager. Pleasure to be here today and uh, provide a, a bit of an overview of our proposed capital plan. I know you had a meeting uh, to discuss the operating budget, went through some questions. That tonight we'll give you kind of detail on what's included in this document. Uh, it's, a, it's a good year for capital planning, despite, I think, some of the concerns and the difficulties we're facing. Uh, with the operating budget this year, we're fortunate to still have a robust uh, uh, capital appropriation recommended as part of the 2021 budget. Uh, my apologies if you heard most of this, uh, if you were watching the council meeting on Tuesday night, a lot of this will be a repeat, so so bear with me. Uh, I'm sure you all have individual questions uh, at the end of it. So I'll try to be brief on, on, on what you've typically seen here. Uh, you know, we would usually give you a bit of a highlight reel and, and a, an a overall presentation of the status of capital as part of your joint meeting with the Public Works Commission. I know that wasn't able to happen this year uh, given the COVID crisis. So I'll try to fit some of that in tonight as well as walk you through what's uh, in the plan document. So uh, next slide, please, Marty, if we could. You've seen this before, talked a little bit about it uh, Tuesday night with the council. And, and, I goes, and I know this goes without saying with this group, uh, the CIP is important for a lot of reasons. Uh, it affects our quality of life. Uh, it affects uh, our property values and in, in, in the way that our community looks and feels. Uh, I think just recent evidence of that, the, the slurry and street rehabilitation program that's currently underway in our community. Uh, I think Commissioner Solomon, you brought that up earlier. That is exactly reflective of the type of changes that a neighborhood goes through when we make investments in sidewalks, streets, gutters, et cetera. Uh, our, our overall health and safety, the safety of the streets. Uh, we've been very fortunate the last few years to remove trip and fall hazards along our sidewalks. In fact, I think we corrected something like 5,200 deficiencies uh, in this current fiscal year. Uh, ultimately, what that does is make sure our, our pedestrians and community who are walking in our neighborhoods uh, are, are that much safer when they do so, particularly in the dark. Uh, economic development, we've, we've noticed this in Riviera Village. We've observed this up on Artesia Boulevard. When we as a community make an investment in our public space, uh, whether it's landscaping, whether it's lighting, street in infrastructure, the surrounding business community tends to follow. And we've seen that in both places. And, and, and our investment in our document here is a big trigger uh, to reinvestment by the private community, private sector, to overall help uh, the look and feel of our of our great city, and then of course city liability. Uh, when whatever we do uh, to improve uh, our assets uh, and the operation, the efficiency of those assets ultimately helps uh, avoid future problems. Sanitary sewer overflows. Uh, I mentioned trip and falls, things of that nature. It's important that uh, we invest in capital. Uh, to avoid uh, maintenance and operational issues and safety issues down the road that ultimately cost the city money on the back end. Next slide, please. How do we evaluate projects that are proposed uh, by the departments each year? This, this standard, this criteria has been pretty consistent for us over the years. Uh, does it improve health and safety? Is it, is it a mandate of a state, local, or federal government uh, agency? Uh, does it help implement a strategic plan goal of the community? Uh, does it complete in an existing project? The reason we have this phrase the way we do is because there's a lot of momentum that is built with project development, design development, and execution. The last thing we like to, we like to do is to start a project, invest money in pre-design and engineering, get it to plans and specifications, get it to construction phase, and then have that fail for either lack of funding or, or, or some other uh, crisis. So it, it, there's so much invested in the start of projects, the conceptualization and the, in the pre-engineering, we like to see them through. And so what you'll see oftentimes in our capital plan, seed money uh, invested uh, for that analysis, that pre-work, and then later as we know that project starts to gain momentum, 
uh, multiple year funding commitments to see it through to the end. Uh, that's why that question is, is posed the way it is in our evaluative criteria. Uh, does it support economic development? Mentioned the benefits of that earlier, that's obvious. Uh, will it result in operating savings? Uh, again, if, if we have streets that have not been resurfaced for many years, that's just that many more potholes to fill. That's that many more uh, hazards in, in our curb and gutter areas that we have to later maintain through spot work. So uh, that that's when we invest, we ultimately save money in the long run, as I mentioned. But Marty, I think we lost a slide there somewhere. Maybe back one. There we go. And then, of course, is there outside funding to support the effort? We receive a lot of uh, money from our federal, state, county, and regional partners. Most of our capital plan, and this plan has $58 million in it, 82 projects, $58 million. A very small percentage of that, of that amount is from city discretionary dollars, money that could otherwise be spent on general operations. It comes from dedicated transportation sources like Proposition C or state gas tax or some of the regional sales tax measures that have been approved in LA County like Measure R or Measure M. Recently, the county also approved uh, Measure W funding, it's called. That's money for storm uh, water quality improvements out in Santa Monica Bay and other watersheds. So those sources of funds are the big driver uh, for uh, our robust plan. We also do a great job and it's big kudos to our public works department, finance and others that support the effort in obtaining grants. This year's plan has over a million dollars of competitive grant funding that our project engineers went out, sought through applications and were able to obtain. Four projects in particular, a little over a million dollars and actually in the next fiscal year, expecting on the back end uh, over $2 million for those multi-year grants. So. That's a, that's a big part of what we do. That's why we've had success and our community for years has, has done a good job chasing outside funding. Next slide, please, Marnie. So the accomplishments, I mentioned uh, it was a robust year for capital. Uh, we didn't get a chance to give you this presentation a couple months ago, so we're gonna work it in now. We've completed 17 projects this fiscal year, which is great. Now, you'll notice some of these projects were completed on the early side of the fiscal year uh, some later, and then there's a next slide that's going to talk about projects we've initiated in design or now currently in construction. So some of the, and, and this is in part due to the fact that most of our projects are a multi-year process, right? And it, this reflects the year that it actually got done. So Pacific Coast Highway, for a long time, this commission's heard about it, the council's uh, been asking for it for some time. This Pacific Coast Highway, northbound right turn lane at Torrance Boulevard, is literally a project that's been over a decade in the making. We actually got it done this fiscal year. I'm so happy to see this off the books <laughs> forevermore and actually get to drive through that lane. So that was done. We had three very robust resurfacing projects on major arterials. Prospect Avenue between Barrel and Del Amo got resurfaced this year. Inglewood Avenue between Grant and 190th got resurfaced this year. And Flagler Lane near Dominguez Park there between Barrel and 190th got resurfaced this year. So big projects there. Uh, early in the year, we wrapped up our Riviera Village Enhancements Project. That had been ongoing, multiple phases of that effort. And you can see that in the, in the aesthetic and bucolic feel of that, uh, that uh, key commercial sector. We, imp uh, we improved Anderson Park this year. There was a new restroom installed, uh, a picnic shelter area near the scout houses and the basketball court, uh, and some walkway improvements. Uh, the Veterans Park play equipment, which was many years in the making, was executed and implemented this year. Unfortunately, shortly after the unveiling, we had to put yellow ribbon around it for COVID purposes. So it's been closed for the better part of its uh, creation, but it's there, it's a great project. And boy, for the, the month and a half or so that it was open, it was widely used, very popular. Accompanying that was our National Fitness Center. There's a little kind of sport workout area adjacent to Veterans Park equipment. Uh, that's used by a variety of folks, very popular. That was a grant funded effort in part. Uh, both of those work uh, in a very complimentary way, highly popular, but also closed uh, currently due to COVID. Uh, we spent money resurfacing existing play equipment areas this year. We hit a few parks in the community, three in fact. We finally rehabilitated. Uh, we haven't, most of you probably haven't a chance to get into it yet, but our main ele elevator at the library, which has been problematic for years, received a full reconstruction effort this year. That project was complete. 
Uh, and that was really a precursor to what was supposed to be us temporarily for community meetings such as yourselves, uh, commission and council meetings, working out of the library while we then embark on our broader council chamber project, which is coming uh, this, this next fiscal year. So uh, the library elevator is done and, and it's working well, thankfully. Uh, citywide curb ramps, um, always an annual project. We've been focused on that uh, for some time. We receive a little under $200,000 a year through our community development block grant annual federal allocation. That goes right to uh, project curbs. We've got another $168,000, $170,000 in this year's budget for appropriation. That'll buy us 25, 30 curbs, depending on the location. Uh, Palos Verdes Boulevard median replacement, just at the city boundary there between Torrance. Uh, hopefully you've driven that and seen that improvement, a nice nice upgrade to what was there before. And then a big one, not, not all that heralded, I said it on Tuesday night, uh, the Ringe sewer pump station. It's the largest uh, sewer lift station we have in town. This was a multi-million dollar project. Uh, it, it sits there in concert with the play field right off a of Ringe. It is a massive effort. It's a very critical piece of infrastructure for us. Uh, from a sewer system standpoint, we are happy that that is now up and running and functional and working great. Uh, we had to replace our compressed natural gas fueling station at the public works yard. That had been down for many, uh, many years, actually. Uh, unfortunately, we were having to send our vehicles out of the city to, to fuel. Uh, we had some low flow capacity, but certainly did not have our quick fill capacity, which was critical for some of our larger vehicles. That is now completed, back up and running and allows uh, us to contribute towards uh, some of that, that green fuel system, if you will, recognizing it's, it is still a, uh, a fossil fuel uh, form of uh, transportation, but, but a, a critical piece of infrastructure for us to, to fuel the various bits of vehicles that we have that, that run on that. Uh, we installed a low flow diversion device at Torrance Circle there in Veterans Park. Uh, great project uh, for many years, if you followed the Santa Monica Baykeeper group, uh, and the Heal the Bay uh, report card that comes out that talks about water quality. The, the area just below the pier historically has received very poor marks. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the storm drain that flows underneath the pier. This uh, low flow diversion device should greatly improve the quality of the water in that area. So we're very pleased to see this uh, installed and, and operational. Hasn't really been tested yet. Um, got a little bit of a test with that storm we had a couple weeks back, but uh, we'll see that uh, next winter. And then we had a, a couple of, uh, we had a sewer repair there in Veterans Park that, uh, you know, kind of a standard operating procedure. So next slide, please, Marnie. So I talked about the projects completed. Here are the projects in the fiscal year we uh, completed design and are out in construction on or are close to completing design on. Uh, again, the citywide slurry seal program, you're seeing that this was our first tranche of that activity. Historically, we'd only focus on reconstruction uh, in working with engineering and, and really evaluating our pavement management study that we do every three years to assess the quality of our streets. It was clear that we could get more bang for our buck in upgrading our system citywide by investing money in slurrying already high quality roads to preserve their life into the future. Uh, this uh, current slurry project's a little under $400,000 and a lot of streets uh, receive treatment through that fund. Uh, next year's budget has, should, will have, if council approves as recommended, a little over a million dollars available for that program and uh, should allow us to expand that effort uh, farther. Residential street resurfacing. This was the biggest street resurfacing project we have embarked on in our history, a little under $5 million in the current scope of work that's being completed as we speak. Uh, over the next several weeks throughout town. Uh, big project, uh, and I've, I've followed this for years, been with the city for a long time. You know, at, at most, and I said this Tuesday night, at most I think we constructed or and implemented in any one's project cycle a little under $2 million. This is nearly two and a half times that amount. Big effort, um, and I think been very well received by the community. A little bit of parking issues here and there, a little bit of things like that during COVID and everything else, but been a very positive project and, and will benefit from that for quite some time. North Redondo Beach bikeway improvements, those are largely constructed and done. We're still in the maintenance period for the landscaping that's been installed. So the fencing's still up around that area. 
I'm talking about the two blocks that are north and south of Artesia Boulevard along the bike path. Uh, we've got water-wise planting that's in there, a new uh, xerophytic uh, and uh, water infiltration parking lot uh, that's on site that will help some offset parking there for the Artesia corridor uh, in the neighborhood. Uh, that is going to be a great project when it's fully open to the public. Thankfully, the decomposed uh, granite uh, walkways adjacent to the bike path are now available to the public for use, uh, but the rest of the project should be opening up here in the next month. Uh, we've started electrical upgrades down at Alta Vista Park. This Julia Field is, is where our, the ball fields that the city owns at Alta Vista Park are housed. If you've been down there uh, in the last couple of years, the local Little League uh, and, it, well, Redondo Sunset and AYSO, Redondo Sunset also does softball. Uh, they've been using temporary generators, spot generators to fuel temporary lights. Um, having a daughter who had played down there for some time, not a great environment for fans, not a great environment for the neighborhood. Um, it, and it's, it's been problematic. We've had lots of complaints about that. What we ultimately did as a city is invest in now standby electrical uh, apparatus that will plug in and allow for uh, more permanentized lights that will be fueled by electricity rather than temporary fuel. So nice upgrade there. It, it won't look much different than what the community sees there today, but functionally be a massive improvement and the neighborhood uh, from a air quality standpoint, uh, will be will be greatly improved. Uh, I mentioned the Redondo Beach TV broadcast facility upgrades. It, that's really the council chamber audiovisual and council chamber lobby and council chamber seating improvement project. Uh, this is funded exclusively with what we call PEG fees. Uh, they're a standalone fee that can't be used for anything but broadcast purposes for council meetings, commission meetings, and the like. Thankfully, the chambers as a facility fall into that eligibility category because it becomes effectively the set, if you will, the stage for the broadcast for those meetings. So we're able to get a very robust multi-million dollar upgrade to the interior of our council chambers, most of it AV equipment. Um, some of you have been tracking this for some time, know the frustration with our existing uh, audiovisual apparatus, the, the, the age of it, it's not functioning well. It's, it's, uh, it's long, long in the tooth and, and, and ready for upgrade. The transit center, uh, been on this list for many years. Uh, grateful that the council uh, was able to award a contract for construction uh, last month. Uh, we are uh, waiting to execute that agreement until the final funding is put in place by Metro, uh, which we're expecting here in a couple of weeks. And uh, we'll be up and running with what amounts to a multi-phase uh, upgrade to the Kingsdale corridor that starts first with the construction of the new transit center on that vacant lot that's just south of Target. And then eventually we will decommission and restore the current transit center that's part and parcel to the parking structure in the, at the Galleria site. That will be removed and then restored to parking. And then we will begin our street realignment program and the installation of additional turn lanes on Kingsdale and a new streetscape program with parkway, landscaping, lighting, et cetera, uh, that will both buffer the parking structure from the neighborhood across the street, as well as improve vehicle tra uh, traffic flow and uh, the pedestrian feel of that neighborhood. So gonna be a really nice project when it's all said and done. I, I get questions, you know, wh what's the why is the transit center so expensive? Uh, thankfully it's funded entirely by transportation restricted monies and not city discretionary monies. Uh, but what it really is, is a street project in addition to a transit center construction. And it really, uh, if, even if you're not a big fan of transit operations, you, you'll, you'll be, I think, very pleased with the improvements to Kingsdale and that entire neighborhood once it's done. Uh, the Alta Vista sewer pump station, we're completing design there. That's another multi-million dollar uh, sewer lift facility, very critical uh, in its location. Uh, quite a bit of watershed in that area and uh, another big project that we'll be embarking on from a construction standpoint next fiscal year design is nearing the end. Uh, we are working hard to upgrade our traffic signals. Some of them are antiquated. They lack the smart technology that allows them to uh, work with others and be synchronized. We're making improvements there. You'll see later in our uh, appropriations that we're actually recommending new money for synchronization in our major corridors. 
Uh, Grand Avenue, well, this is a project in itself, although I think I jumped past Green Street improvements. What that is, is a complimentary project to our regular commercial improvements um, that uh, allows us to install Green Street uh, amenities, uh, things like French drains or permeable paving that, or diversion that allows us to capture stormwater runoff on these, these boulevards before it hits our storm drain system. And it's with bioremediation and the like, it improves the water quality that ultimately drains into Santa Monica Bay. Uh, Grand Avenue signal improvements, this was a grant funded effort a few years back through Metro. Uh, it should uh, allow all of the lights along Grant to talk to one another, allow us to, to work better from a flow standpoint, time of day, use, demand, et cetera. Uh, we've been working long and hard uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's a process because it's taken property acquisition work um, you know, with robust negotiations, working with the landlord, the owner, it's, there's a whole bunch of apparatus out there. There's a lot of utility infrastructure that's in, in the way, but this Inglewood, uh, southbound right turn lane at Manhattan Beach Boulevard project right there in front of the Chevron. Is that a Chevron? Maybe it's not Chevron 76, maybe Six. that, that, uh, as y'all have driven that many times, it's a, it's a backup. It's a narrow lane. It creates conflict. What this will do is actually in, install a dedicated right turn lane that will push back, allow for more queuing, and should help with southbound traffic on Inglewood in general at that intersection. So that project uh, is ready to go. The, the current obstacle is Metropolitan Water District has a big venting uh, and a vault right in that area that needs to be relocated before we can actually install the turn lane. We have the property in hand. We've finalized the negotiations there. Um, we're just waiting for Metro to get out of the way and then we can start our effort. And eventually in partnership with Lawndale, that whole intersection is going to change. There's going to be quite a few, uh, uh, improvements to the Lawndale side of the street as well as ours. So, uh, look for, uh, you know, a couple years away still, but eventually that, that, that area will, um, will flow much better than it does today. Although during COVID it's actually moving pretty well. I'm sure that will change once we get back to hopefully normal. Um, Peer parking structure, critical repairs. This project's really almost done. Another $2 million this year invested in improving the structure, uh, waterproofing the facility, removing old spalling, uh, making sure that it, we've, we've got any potential hazard uh, removed in place. Uh, in this case, we spent a lot of money uh, removing and replacing the railing up above Kincaid's at the, at the plaza deck at the top. Very ugly. A uh, bit of uh, infrastructure there in the past used to rust, used to kind of bleed down the facade of the various decks of the structure. Uh, so that is really nice to see that improved. And, and we're in the in kind of the punch list finishing stages of the project. There is a, a structural wall that we're actually was a uh, change order of the project that uh, is below the substation that we're working on right now. Um, that's kind of the end of the end of the effort. Uh, for this phase. Uh, we've been pretty good the last three years spending about two million dollars every other year uh, improving the structure uh, to try to extend its useful life, um, which is which is a challenge to say the least. Uh, we are working on improvements to peer restrooms uh, and then of course every year we spend money improving our sanitary sewer infrastructure, really our pipes, our sewer pipes. Uh, we, we CCTV them, we camera them, uh, we look for deficiencies, we spot the deficiencies, and we replace them before they create overflows. And, uh, and that's been a very good effort for us over the years. So 17 completed, 14 design and construction, really robust year, 1920 for capital. Uh, big shout out to Public Works. I said it uh, quite a bit Tuesday night. They've done a great job. And, and as, as the council pointed out, it, it is a team effort. It isn't just Public Works. It's the operating departments. It's finance. It's the attorney's office helping with contracts. It's a it's a citywide effort to, and it's the neighborhood, it's the residents providing input and working with our contractors, et cetera, to get this done. But it, it's uh, in total, we'll have spent about $12 million on capital efforts in 1920. So really good year. Next slide. So what's left in the, in the book, um, and some of this carryover money is still for those 14 projects we just discussed, but in total, we're carrying over $46 million, a uh, pretty common number for us. Uh, most of that's in the street projects area, 18 million, as you see, 29 active street efforts. A lot of that, that 18 million, mo really most of that is the uh, neighborhood residential resurfacing program. That's a contract worth just under $5 million. 
We haven't paid out on that entirely yet. That's a big, big, uh, big portion of that. As are our commercial streets that are queuing up, Manhattan Beach Boulevard, uh, Barrel, Torrance, those types of areas uh, are, are big tranches there. Kingsdale, which is part of that transit center effort, et cetera. Uh, waterfront, we have uh, existing money there. Some of that's pier structure. Uh, some of that is the Harbor Patrol docks. Uh, we have a dredging project that's in the queue. We have harbor railing money that's been set aside for improvements, uh, uh, pier uh, infrastructure repair, et cetera. Uh, we have a little under $6 million that's carrying over. What you'll notice though, and this goes to our operating budget issue, we have zero new appropriations uh, in the Uplands and Tidelands area in the 2021 proposed budget. We are relying entirely on carryover and in, in completing those projects because we do have a structural deficit uh, in both the uplands and tidelands operationally. So we did not want to further strain those funds with new capital appropriations. Park projects, like I said, 1.7 million. A lot of that is the Dominion's park project that's carrying over. We do have another supplemental appropriation recommended this year to make sure we have that fully funded. Uh, there's some money in there for the Dominguez dog park improvements as well. Public facility projects, most of that 12 million, 12, six is the transit center. Um, there are some other, you know, police station improvements. There's some money uh, for HVAC improvements at City Hall, roof repairs and things like that. Really basic kind of maintenance and operations items, uh, just core infrastructure replacement. The general projects account is uh, things like uh, citywide street signage, path of history, some smaller things. Uh, sewer projects, uh, mentioned range being complete, this seven millions carrying over Alta Vista Capital and the design money needed for uh, our next round of lift station improvements like Portofino and the others. Uh, Marine, uh, there's a, Marina Way has a, has a facility as well. Uh, so, and some of this is our regular reconstruction money that I mentioned earlier too. And then drainage, uh, this, these drainage funds are our enhanced watershed management program. That's our partnership effort uh, to, uh, to comply with what we call the municipal stormwater permit, the MPDES permit. You hear that phrase a lot uh, that is uh, ordered uh, by the Regional Water Quality Control Board that we have to operate within. Uh, this is an interesting area. This number would have been a little bit bigger um, as a carryover item, but for our uh, operating crisis uh, from the budget standpoint, what we were able to do in the recommended operating budget is sweep out uh, a little under $2.4 million of general discretionary funds. A million of that 2.4 was the set aside from year end, the 18-19 CAFR review, where we would normally set a million aside and get it ready for appropriation and allocation in the upcoming fiscal year. So that was an obvious takeaway, but a, another a million of that, it came out of uh, pre-existing enhanced watershed management program projects. The big one was the uh, stormwater infiltration project in partnership with Hermosa Beach. You might remember the, the Green Street, the Valley Street uh, drama that ensued with Hermosa. Residents ultimately rejected that uh, water quality improvement project, sort of told Hermosa Beach no, who was the lead agency. Well, we had put a lot of money, we had set a lot of money aside to partner in that effort. So, and all of that money was general fund money. So we have backed that money out. And that's a big part of what we're transferring into the operating budget to balance this fiscal year. So fortunate, I mean, still think it would have been a great project in Hermosa Beach, but if they're not gonna build it, we're gonna have to look for alternatives and we'll do it now with measure W funding on a go forward basis. And a little bit of what's uh, recommended here, we've left the money we need to leave in there for obligations to meet current obligations. But um, the big number in there this would have been 1.7 plus million, um, but for the disillusion of that funding agreement with Hermosa Beach, uh, Torrance and Manhattan Beach for that particular uh, Green Street uh, project there in, in Hermosa. So uh, fortunate for our operating budget, uh, not so great, I think, for ultimate stormwater quality improvements in Santa Monica Bay, but you know we'll, we'll look for alternatives. Next slide. So, uh, What's recommended in for new funding? Uh, so each year, we and this is this is the trick. So we have the carryover money, forty six million dollars. It doesn't get a lot of attention, but the council does take action with their budget adoption uh, in the resolution to actually carry and reappropriate all of that forty six million dollars. It doesn't automatically go. 
They have to each and every year, because we only do one year appropriations, each and every year they have to pick that money up and say, yes, we want to continue to spend in these areas. So, um, so, but that is typically viewed as not that discretionary because those are uh, projects that are under in motion and viewed as priority of the community already, and we're just carrying them forward. This is the money that has now come available to us, and we're now appropriating anew. Uh, again, the lion's share of this $11.7 million is coming from external and restricted sources of funds that we can't take and go spend somewhere else. And in fact, just about all of it this year, because a big chunk of the 11 7 we were fortunate, I mentioned, we transferred our general discretionary funds out of the capital plan this year so we could use it for operations. We were fortunate, given the timing, to backfill that with leftover South Bay Galleria bond funding, that bond had been paid off a couple of years ago. Those proceeds uh, are, are currently in, this, the, in our uh, CFA account, our finance authority account, and can be used for citywide capital projects. They can't be used for operations, but they can be used for capital. So a good chunk of the money that's being appropriated here, about 2.2 million of that, is fortunately the timing is good because we're we're stripping out 2.4 million of general fund money and we're backfilling that with 2.2 million of CFA money um, to offset that kind of capital impact. But that's a good chunk of what's happening here. So uh, timing was fortunate, uh, and we will see a few uh, in the next couple of years. We'll see more accrual tax increment accrual that we'll be able to actually use out of the CFA for capital. Uh, from those uh, bonds that have been paid off, but there's still uh, increment uh, phase out. So fortunate there, uh, and it's it's been it's healthy for our capital plan this year in particular. So 13 project streets, you know, we've got money in parks, sewer, et cetera. We'll get into the specifics now. I, I should mention 29 appropriations here, only nine projects that are new to the capital plan. So 20 of the 29 are supplementing existing projects nine are actually new projects to the CIP. Next slide, please, Maureen. So uh, this is a new one, uh, $400,000 grant funded effort, competitive grant funded effort. Uh, this is for uh, westbound right turn lane uh, from Hirondo Anita there uh, heading towards PCH. Uh, you know, needed should be helpful. There's a little bit of a parking conversation there. I think we're able to deal with right of way and make that work, but that uh, gets this process started uh, and I think constructed. I think the 400 actually includes both design and construction. It's a, it's, a, it's more of a street striping effort than it is uh, anything else. I think maybe some detection loops too. Uh, Barrel Street, this is money we're putting back into the account uh, and will allow for full construction or should, depending on final scope. Uh, we took $800,000 of the Barrel Street account uh, money out last fiscal year to load up the uh, neighborhood, uh, neighborhood street reconstruction fund. So the residential reconstruction fund. We are putting that money back. This is Prop C money. It's available to us. Uh, we're doing the same thing with Manhattan Beach Boulevard, that $800,000. Between those two projects, we took 1.6 million, stuck it in the neighborhood uh, road re resurfacing program, and we're now paying that back. So Barrel Street uh, will get going. We're out to bid right now for proposals. Uh, we're seeking proposals for design of this project, uh, and we think we'll have a recommendation for a contract award in early July. Should take about a year to design it, hopefully building it in 21-22. Uh, Bicycle transportation plan money, the $75,000, we do it every year. Uh, this is our 10% commitment from our uh, local allocation for Measure R funds that we put into bicycle uh, efforts. Typically, it then gets redistributed to other efforts. Maybe it's lighting on the North Redondo Beach bike path. Maybe it's money to, to strike some lanes somewhere else. Uh, there hasn't been a specific call for this yet this fiscal year. Mentioned citywide curb ramps. We've got another $186,000 of CDBG funds. Like I said, should be 25, 30 ramps that'll be paid for with that money. Uh, $293,000 supplemental appropriation to the slurry seal program. Uh, that's on top of about 700, a little over $700,000 of existing funds. So we'll have, like I said, a little over a million dollars uh, to apply to streets uh, this next fiscal year. The council will ultimately, depending on the final funding, 
when they receive the, the most recent pavement management study report, which is expected this fall, they'll get a chance uh, to then evaluate what streets will receive the next tranche of money. Um, and you know, we use the, the PCI index, pavement condition index. Um, that's usually what drives our decision-making and uh, there'll be a robust report on that in the fall. Council will then decide what streets will be included and funded, and then we'll roll out plans and specs and probably start building sometime, I'm guessing, in 21-22 when it all gets down to it. Mentioned Manhattan Beach Boulevard. This is the resurfacing effort, uh, streetscape improvements on the medians. Uh, this is really Aviation Inglewood's big stretch. And this is supplementing funding that's there. Uh, it's a multi-million dollar project when all said and done. We received competitive grant to construct uh, a continuation of North Rhode Beach bike path from Felton to Inglewood. There's a missing segment. You all, I think, are aware of that. Uh, this is great. This money is uh, the first uh, first of two uh, two grant payoffs. First uh, 500000 this fiscal year. We're receiving another $500,000 from Metro the next fiscal year. That million dollars will get us that next couple of block length to Inglewood. It won't cross Inglewood there. And that's what this $60,000 does down below. That's designing a spur that'll run the bike path south along Inglewood to connect it to the intersection that is the sort of Grant Ripley exchange. And then, then bikes can safely migrate down Grant and head off down to the Galleria or uh, uh, other areas. Eventually, we'd love to see a more robust connector that gets either over or under the uh, existing uh, rail system there. That's uh, the Gal QIC is part of their project. You might recall is they're committed to funding the design effort uh, for figuring out how to do that. Of course, all of that's going to be subjected to whatever Metro standards are, depending on where the green line ev ends up going. So candidly, that's probably years off if ever. So what we're focused on is let's figure out a safe way to just get the bike path the North Carolina Beach bike path down to Grant and cross at Grant on an existing class two facility. That's what the $60,000 is. Next, next slide, please, Marty. 1.4 million supplements, what'll be a couple hundred thousand dollars of carryover funds for the residential street rehab program. We're expecting to have about 1.8 mil, 1 million for net, the next phases. Uh, that'll go along with the million for slurry. So, you know, almost 3 million in total to work with as we uh, make those allocations. And then we're, we're putting a significant amount. This is a big, big call on the $2.2 million of the left the, out of the, the CFA funding. Uh, what we're continuing here with the 700 is about $500,000 of that is going to go towards com continuing this uh, ramp and grind program that we've had so much success with in town. I'm sure some of you have seen it in your neighborhoods. We have, we have gone out and inspected and identified via GIS every trip and fall deficiency in our sidewalk system. I mentioned we've corrected 5,200 of those deficiencies this fiscal year. We have many more to go. Uh, $500,000 of this 700 will actually complete that effort. So we will have corrected all deficiencies identified as part of the last study. Uh, and then of course, we'll be on to the next study at some point, but really a good effort uh, by Public Works, and then we hire a contractor to come in and do the work, and they really knock it out in a very quick and efficient way. So um, hopefully you're seeing that in your community, uh, and it's uh, we want to continue that because it really does speak to longer-term liability for us. The remaining funding we would like to use kind of split into two. We'd like to spend about $100,000 of that uh, down at Riviera Village to ex extend the enhancement program that we have down there for our streetscape sidewalk area and then another $100,000 uh, up at Artesia to try to continue to beautify that commercial sector. So ultimately council will have to decide how and where that money's spent, but that's really what this budget's for. A couple hundred thousand dollars in our commercial districts and then $500,000 to complete our uh, ramp and grind program. The $820,000 here, Torrance Boulevard resurfacing, we borrowed that money, not borrowed, we advanced what was otherwise Prop C funding to close out the transit center contract. This Prop C funny in this allocation now goes back to Torrance Boulevard. And really that project's not missing a beat. It's continuing as if it was always in the plan. We weren't prepared uh, to execute this project now uh, any, for all, any circumstance. It's just not quite ready in the queue, uh, but it's gonna get there soon. 
Traffic calming has been very popular with the council, $240,000 supplemental funding there. We've spent most of, not quite all, but almost all of the monies that are there uh, in the current account. Uh, this goes for things like uh, speed studies, uh, speed cushions, uh, streetway realignment, um, different types of radar systems, uh, the temporary traffic circles that are popular some places and not popular others, uh, those types of things. So um, really looking for creative ways to try to calm our traffic, create safe speeds and, and, and really improve our pedestrian mobility <laughs> and the feel of that. Uh, and then the last thing is a $200,000 grant traffic signal network system upgrade. What this is, is an assessment of our existing arterials uh, and the network system. And then there's a million eight coming the following fiscal year from this is competitive money from Metro that we'll then use to actually make the installations to synchronize our, our, our different arterials. So really good multi-year project that when, it, when it's done should, like I said earlier, improve traffic flow in town. And I know that's been an issue for this commission and public works commission for some time. Uh, next slide, please. Park improvements I mentioned, uh, 60, an additional 60K for the dog park. We have 60 there now. This will take it up to 120. Fencing, entry point improvements. There's uh, grading degradation. We got a lot to do out there. The biggest roadblock candidly to improving the dog park is what surfacing we can use because it's underneath the transmission corridor with Edison. Um, we would love to put you know, bark down or some other things, wood chips. Unfortunately, Edison's given us very few options. It's dirt or it's grass and grass doesn't work too well um, in that environment or, or at least hasn't historically. We haven't been able to keep up with that. So uh, we're gonna put some money, spend some money, try to improve that facility. Um, you know, we could actually probably do that for a while. It, it, it needs work. Uh, and then some additional money for the Dominguez Park Play Equipment Project. Much like Veterans Park that was successful, Dominguez is ready for a big uh, upgrade. It's been many years. We have ADA issues. We have surfacing issues. We have accessibility issues um, just for general use. Doesn't work well with our perimeter walkway system. Dominguez is, is, is a challenging facility. It needs some TLC. Uh, and then we have some more money here, 60K for uh, additional uh, existing place surface replacement. Next slide, please. So getting into public facilities, this first... First chunk of money, uh, $100,000, is our effort to start the process of vacating the community services office lease up, our, up off of Artesia Boulevard. I, I think you're all aware of this. We spend about $250,000 a year renting that office building. We used to be called the cotton shop. Um, you know, that lease payment that we write every year is painful. I mean, we're a, a, we're a city, we have facilities, we have assets. We shouldn't be renting anything candidly for an extended period of time. Uh, it made some sense when we were stuck down at the Knob Hill site, the old Patterson school site, and, uh, and we were paying rent to the school district and we got out of that. Cotton Shop was, a, was an upgrade from that. But at this point, uh, and especially considering as we've reduced our workforce over the years, we have capacity at City Hall we have capacity in our library so we have capacity in existing city owned facilities that I think uh, if we're creative and we design them well, could easily house community services functions and certainly the counter functions. So this is money to say, let's go out and figure out where we can move them to a, a permanent home uh, that we no longer have to pay rent for. Uh, the next project is the next phase. We've been figuring out in assessment, what's the best way to tackle are very antiquated and very loud uh, and very neighborhood unfriendly shooting range uh, that has gotten more unfriendly as the wind has blown over some of the sound attenuation uh, boards. Uh, and this is the design of, and we studied this, the first assessment looked at a full reconstruction of that facility. That was a more than $10 million effort, order of magnitude, somewhere between 10 and 12 million, too much money, not something we can afford. So what we've been looking into are prefabricated modular units you can actually connect. And because of that footprint, we could actually drop them into the facility and, and make them fairly discreet with some perimeter upgrades. That's about 20% of the cost of a full reconstruct. This is the money that would be used to design that and get figure out what we have to do from a pad 
and utility connection standpoint to get that moving. Uh, $120,000 uh, towards the electronic signboard up at the Performing Arts Center. Big entry point for our community. Very good community messaging board. It's very antiquated. You can hardly read some of the letters. It Technology's grown leaps and bounds since it was last put in. Uh, it's, it's a good upgrade and, it, and it's, it's time for it. We had in the, in the budget, in the carryover, $400,000 to replace the seats in the Performing Arts Center. We've actually pulled that out. I mentioned the EWIP money that was part of that $2.4 million transfer from the capital plan to the operating budget. One million was the initial set aside. Another million was for storm quality projects that we no longer have to build. Well, the last $400,000 was the seat replacement project account we created in the last couple of years. We're no longer gonna do that. We pulled the 400 out, but we're putting 120 back to get the sign restored. So the pack is basically going down about 280 in capital funds as a result of, of the two actions, just to put that into some perspective. And then $180,000 of additional PEG funds, non-discretionary funds going to the uh, council chamber project. And then again, $35,000 to upgrade the transit operations center. This is their maintenance building. Again, this is not a general discretionary fund. This $35,000 is formulaic and it goes to the transit operating <coughs> budget via federal state metro funds. So um, if it were discretionary, maybe not something we would recommend, but this is very restrictive in what we can do with these funds. Next slide, please. Drainage, uh, $200,000 for general drainage improvements throughout the community. Uh, we have sinkholes. We try to get in front of them. We have a lot of corrugated metal pipe that has, is in, in its latter years of life. Uh, we've had a lot of success with lining, proactive lining efforts. Um, and we, we want to do more of that. And it does give us a bit of a placeholder. When we had the sinkhole out on Hawthorne, uh, we had a sinkhole out on Marine. We are able to use this pot of money to go out, tackle that project, get it repaired on an emergency basis, and not have to do a fiscal appropriation on an emergency basis. So we can react very quickly. And ideally, we through our cameraing program, we can find deficiencies before they fail, and we can line it and go from there. So money well spent, we think, here. Uh, this $500,000 for EWIMP, the storm NPDES uh, project I, I mentioned, uh, this is Measure W funding. It can only be used for stormwater quality improvements. That's what we're now using to pay for our EWIMP obligations on a go-forward basis. Uh, and then that $200,000 of Green Street, again, those supplement projects throughout the community. But in this case, it's a partnership effort with Manhattan Beach and Torrance uh, for a treatment uh, that uh, ultimately flows to the Dominguez Channel. It's a contractual commitment with them. Next slide, please. Oh, I won't bore you with this. We talked about it. Alta Vista sewer. This is the construction amount. We've got it designed. And then we start the design of Morgan, the Morgan sewer pump lift, uh, lift station, Portofino and Yacht Club Way. And then we've got another half a million dollars in there for general repairs to the system. That picture you see down there, that's the Ringe, uh, Ringe sewer lift station there next to Full Playfield and the uh, school site. So uh, that's a great project. And really tonight, it's uh, kind of discuss, uh, take possible action. I know you're trying to, I think, formulate your letter to council or your recommendations to council. Um, I, I'm happy to answer any questions you have about capital. I plan to hang in there for you uh, for any questions you have about operations. Uh, I know Marnie has a list that she's going to go through with you, but I'm here uh, for the long haul, or at least until 930 when Steve leaves. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, you know, do, do what you can. So I, I'm around and thank you for the time. Thanks, Mike. Uh, appreciate that. Um, I don't see any uh, hands up right now. Uh, so Marnie, were there some questions uh, for or from the commissioners uh, regarding the capital improvements projects uh, segment of the presentation? None of them were about CIP. Okay. Um, I do have a couple of quick questions. Oh, I'm sorry. I beg your pardon. I do have a couple of hands have gone up now. Um, so I don't know who was first. So I'll uh, ask uh, Commissioner Chun uh, to please uh, ask his question. Yeah, thank you, Mike. And thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm just kind of curious in terms of um, capital improvement for 2020 through 2025 on a, on a fiscal annual basis. Could you just give us the numbers and why the big changes, for example, from Tidelands and Harbor, and then it went down, just high level. 
Yeah, high level. It, it's our concern about our structural situation with both of those funds. I, I mean, it's not the outlook's not good. Uh, I wish it were. Um, we we going into the fiscal year, we were just under two million dollars uh, in deficit in both funds, both the uplands and the tidelands. Four million aggregate to each side. Um, our recommended decision packages close that gap uh, by about fifty percent, a little bit over, a little bit less than that. Take them both down to about one one. Uh, I know there's great likelihood that the council and, and we've heard from the community that is ultimately not going to be supportive, at least initially making mm -hmm. additional changes to the harbor patrol function. That's a big part of the closure on the Tideland side. That's five hundred forty thousand dollars. So figure you put that back in the budget if if that's not acceptable to the community. And basically, we go into twenty twenty one with about a 1.6517 deficit in the Tidelands, um, we got to figure out a way to get to balance. I'm hopeful that we can. Uh, when we have more optimism, you'll see us plan for greater greater numbers in the out years in the CIP. So basically, you've got a pretty, um, I guess, optimistic view then for 2021, sorry, 21, 22, and 22, 23 then. Yeah, what that is is just basic standard. So if you when when we put this together, it's that harkening back to regular appro historic appropriations. Come next fiscal year, if we haven't solved the structure budget, you won't see that planned 22, 23, or 21, 22 number being recommended. I just it they they look good there now, but can't and that is that tracks pretty well with historic appropriations and allocations. We've got some changes to make before we can comfortably get to that again right so it's basically a plug-in number it, thank exactly okay uh commissioner samples please uh thank you um mike just a, a couple of quick questions and really don't want to get into the weeds but just for for the sake of comment uh first of all talking about the uh community services uh, uh renegotiation of the lease um you had up there that it may cost and and i'm guessing that this is just a budgetary number that's a, a plug-in um we read the the lease and and not being a lawyer the only thing i see in there that talks about what happens if we don't pay the lease is the um the the default is termination of the lease i don't right. see where there are any penalties so just for the the sake of discussion um i would hope that our negotiators in the city are, are really good about dealing with that and um, you, you, you make a great point uh commissioner and and when we find a place to take them we'll start thinking about strategy of how to exit the lease assuming the timing doesn't just tick and tie i think we have another four years left on the current term and you and we've thought the same thing um you know we'll we'll pull whatever levers we can but we got to find a home for them first that's well, our and, and it, it may be that, that that's a good location for them and it's just a matter of getting a fair rate um and and dealing with that so that's another option too yeah renegotiation if we can't find a good home for them on a permanent basis we could always try to renegotiate price just point of discussion the other one was on the range um i'm curious about the range and and i understand the desire to have a range and, and the fact that we've had one here forever but police firing ranges are, are traditionally underutilized and we've got other departments in the area that have ranges that some of them are, are really excellent um have there been any discussions about us leasing renting borrowing those range facilities rather there, than there has, money right now yeah no it's a good point there have been some um you know and, and this is the the challenge right i mean in my experience with safety departments really any department everybody wants wants their own facility, they, 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 they like their own facility, they like the, you know, the easy access. So that's the desire of the department. We're trying to help accommodate that, but you're absolutely right. If at the end of the day, we're not able to afford the replacement facility, we would be stuck uh, working out of other, other spots. We already do that for our Longview uh, outdoor activities. We, we have to, I think there's a facility out Riverside that our officers yeah. go out to for higher level SWAT tactical training, things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. This is really more for the day to day. We have a little bit of extra usability in our facility because of the length. Uh, it's, a, it's bigger than a traditional indoor range. Um, but we've had those conversations. We tried to partner with the Air Force. Um, Air Force ultimately wasn't interested because of the current limitations of the space. We've looked at using other facilities, Hermosas, Torrance, et cetera. 
people aren't always apt to share, but you know, things change and, and it's, so it's a fair point. I mean, I, they're, they're uh, just thinking of it as, a, as an interim to get us over this budget hump for the next few months. I, I do get the idea that um, as, especially for those day-to-day -day recurring kinds of um, qualification and training and things, having one local um, and yeah. whether that's in our own building or immediately adjacent, it's probably worthwhile, yeah. but just getting over the hump. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Those are my only questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner Samples. Uh, I don't see any other hands right now, Mike. I have a couple quick questions for you, please. Sure. Uh, has anybody uh, from any of the fund sources like a Measure M or R or uh, some of these state grants attempted to claw back any monies or do we anticipate that they might try and claw back money? Yes, the, the formula will change. Th this anticipates at least to date what we expect to be uh, the allocations next fiscal year. Each of these agencies res reserves the right to make modification. Uh, Brad Lindahl, our capital projects manager, uh, works with his counterparts at these agencies to determine, you know, make best guess as to what will achieve. Uh, so in some instances, they're stuck statutorily and others, they have some flexibility. So what you see in the budget projections now are our best guess today. So would, um, that being said, uh, do you think that there are some projects that we would want to emphasize or prioritize taking beyond the list that you presented and say, we want to use this now because we're not really sure what this agency is going to be doing going forward? Yeah, no, certainly understand the question. Think it's a good thought. I, I think we're we're confident enough that even if we saw a shaving of some of these funds, say a ten percent hit or a fifteen percent hit from where we're already scaling it back, typically what we can do is we just defer the project until we get the next year's tranche and backfill from there. So what it more likely does is eats into our future year of availability and appropriation than it hits our current projects as much. So. I, we feel good about what we're working on. Um, and I think the plan is solid in that respect. Uh, but yes, out your projects could easily be impacted by any kind of callback for these funds. Okay, but nothing to affect us immediately then? No, I don't think so. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, um, remind me if you could please, uh, the skate park, the city was gonna work on funding a skate park. And I think that there was some money that was, uh, allocators set aside for that. Yep. Um, is that something that's um, here in the future five year or it's been taken off of the board by the council? It's the money is still in the carryover. It's going to, it's going to pick up and move to next fiscal year. I forget the exact amount in there now. Um, some, something under a hundred thousand dollars. I'm, I'm pretty sure, but we are still working with the group. Uh, the next step was to identify smaller amenity options uh, I think we were looking at Alta Vista, Anderson, some other areas. We were working with the with the, the partners there, and I think we have a report ready to come back to council. I think this summer to talk about now. Okay, where do we want to invest? Where do we want to actually build these facilities out? Uh, okay, because the expense of Dominguez, I think, became a little problematic with the with the landfill site. Um, you know, it was a I think a two million dollar effort or something in with the pre engineering. Um, so. Uh, we're, we're, we owe council an alternatives discussion, I think, in the next couple months. Okay, thank you. I wasn't sure with the uh, inclusion of the skate park at the Galleria uh, that was part of the settlement through negotiations with QIC, whether or not the council had taken that, uh, taken a step back on that, or we're still pursuing that. They, they've told us to continue to look for alternatives. Okay, great. For our own uh, facility. When, are, um, when do we get uh, Quimby fees paid? Is it when the when the uh, developer gets their project certificate of occupancy, is it when they file for their permit? It's um, it's not occupancy, but it's short of that. It's it's the I think it's the final. Um, it's not demolition. I don't. I can't remember if it's framing or some later permit phase. But it's towards it's towards the tail end of the project, not the front end of the project. Okay. Um, so it's we're we're not. If you're thinking legato, we're we're still a little bit a ways away from achieving uh, those funds there. Okay, yeah, it doesn't seem like anything's going to be kicking off for them uh, in the next. Yeah, in the and next certainly the QIC, year. we're definitely a ways away on the QIC monies. Certainly for that, uh, for the North Redondo Beach bike path, uh, does that funding or that uh, funding for the extension include 
the parking lot there on Artesian 25th, or is it separate? It's separate. Unfortunately, the Metro money would not pay for the complimentary parking facility. So what this would fund is exclusively the bike path itself, the adjacent walkway, and then the lighting. We'll have to separately figure out how to beautify the landscape and or install parking. So we'll need okay. to figure that out second, secondarily. And we don't have any money that's been uh, encumbered for future use towards that right now? Not, not currently, no. No, we've okay. designed it. We've got, we've designed that project, but we, we don't have money to construct that yet. Okay. Uh, so the last, my last question is uh, you've got your evaluation cri criteria um, and you've got your priorities. Those are adjusted then by the council, depending upon which, uh, what they feel like in their discussions and however yeah. they work that out. Absolutely. Uh, so that's all really helpful. Uh, I don't see any other hands up. Um, uh, Commissioner Chun, you still have a hand up. Did you have another question? You're on mute, Warren. Uh, yeah, one question, um, Mike, regarding the transit, um, is that uh, impacted anyway by the, the extension of the Metro line, whether it goes down Hawthorne or the uh, rail? No, no, our, our project is designed as a standalone transit facility for bus operations. The, I, I think the grand vision from Metro's perspective, if they were to use the rail line, the spur that's there today, would be to then co-locate a rail facility adjacent to, so you could effectively walk from the green line to the bus terminal, then get on a bus and go somewhere else. Um, if, if A, ultimately go down Hawthorne, it'll be on them to find a way to connect pedestrians from Hawthorne to our bus terminal. So it works with, it works as a co-location or it works as a standalone, but it's not, it's not an integrated facility by design. Right. So it's independent. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Samples has a question, please. Yeah, I'm sorry. Just one more quick one. Um, in the CIP budget, you've got uh, roughly $56 million there. And I was wondering, um, you said a, a very small portion of this is from general funds. Um, and I'm guessing that uh, some of these grants have matching fund requirements. So it's those are basically required funds no matter what we do. Is there anything else in there that's, that's actually anything material that is discretionary funds that we could use for the, the general budget? Or is, is this pretty much, it is what it is? We, you know, Commissioner, it, it's a good thought. We stripped it, we stripped it out. Really that 1.4 million we clawed out uh, to transfer in, that got us to basically the bare bones that we think we could leave for the EWIMP obligations. Th those, that EWIMP pocket I showed you, that's still mostly general fund. But we, if we take it any further, we won't be, meeting our commitments to our partners. So um, the, and you're absolutely right. There are um, matching obligations with a lot of the monies. What we're usually able to do with some of those competitive grants is match them with local allocation money. So like measure R, measure M, we have our annual allocations. These competitive grants will allow us to take that money and be the match. So it doesn't have to necessarily be general fund. So yeah, yeah we've, we scraped it pretty hard um, of general fund resources at this point, sadly. I mean, I, I take no pleasure in it. Um, it's, it, it was just necessary this year. I, I thought you did. I was just curious because it, it is always one of those questions that comes up. Uh, yeah. And, and in the, the current budget environment, I'm sure that a lot of people spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to shave this, but thank you. Yeah, and candidly, if, if we had any ability to use those CFA funds <laughs> for operations, we probably would have recommended some of that too. Um, but we're fortunate to have that backfill the general fund we've taken out. So okay. thank you. Uh, Mike, uh, a question about the, the gun range as well. Uh, does the cost to re, uh, replan or remodel the range include the remediation that's there? Yeah, the, it does. This 300,000 would handle both of that. It would handle the pre, uh, pre environmental and the environmental design and, and the actual plans and specification development. The beauty of the modular units, so we would clean the site and then we drop the modular units in on a fresh pad and and we've we've moved on and we're we're now fully uh, operating, you know, with modern facility. Has there been a environmental one over there or anything to give us an idea of what we're looking at? 
Well, we did. You, you recall uh, there is an active lawsuit still um, from the neighbors. Um, and we did as an early phase of that. It is a, I don't know if you call it a quasi settlement at the time. It, it didn't. But it was something we reacted to. We funded a cleanup effort. Uh, you might recall uh, we had crews uh, scraping metal shavings uh, from sidewalks. We went over. We uh, worked with the elementary school. We, we resodded their play field did a screening and cleaning of their, uh, of their rooftops, gutters, et cetera. We did that voluntarily to be a good neighbor, um, even though those lead fragments, if they were from the range, you know, had long since been there. I mean, they, they wasn't something we were doing actively anymore. Um, but we've done a, a scrape and, and clean. But, but to your question, I think in the site itself, when we actually remove all of that stuff, and just build a little wall around a new facility. Yeah, that's gonna that's gonna be explored as part of this design in more detail. We our estimates for the twenty percent reconstruction or reinstallation cost include the environmental uh, projection. Get a little more bang for our buck there than just the gun range itself. Yeah, right. abs absolutely. It, it'll be a major improvement of the of the lower part of Dominguez Park. No question. I mean, solves solves a, a bigger problem that we've been dealing with. It, it absolutely does. Uh, Commissioner Chun, did you have a question, sir? Yeah, one more question. Um, just high level, Moonstone Park, it's a pretty big number, 2.4 million. Mm -hmm. Just break it down, just simplistically. Yeah, well, you recall that's a um, that's not as much a project number as that is the amount of money Chevron paid to the city to uh, allow them to offload those coker units. Uh, you might recall a few years back, we worked with them to bring, they were replacing their coker drums at their Chevron refinery. Um, it was cheaper for them, kind of like it was for Northrop to offshore uh, their recent laser device that they were building for the Navy through King Harbor than it was to take it down you know, Pacific Coast Highway down to the Port of Long Beach or LA. So uh, we negotiated a license fee of $2.4 million uh, that in that agreement we said would be used to improve Moonstone Park. Um, so we would have, we're effectively designing to that budget more so than we're saying, you know, you could spend virtually any sum of money to improve Moonstone Park. Um, the way it is, 2.4 mirrors what was provided via the Chevron license. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I think, Commissioner, you're, you're muted, Eugene. Gotcha. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any more hands up. Uh, would any member of the commission like to make a recommendation regarding the capital improvements uh, projects uh, for the council, uh, something that you'd like to weigh in on that you'd like to see done, not done, or changes that you uh, recommend being made. I don't see any takers. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Mike, for doing that. Uh, Marnie, you mentioned that there were no questions regarding this particular segment. Uh, so uh, then uh, we could, uh, is that accurate, Marnie? Right, no CIP questions, but we have some operating budget questions. Okay. So uh, if everyone's all right with it, then let's move back into the operating budget and the format that we used last time seemed to work well where you went through the questions, Marnie. Right. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, please uh, start there. Yeah, and we don't have as many this time. Um, so I'm just going to go through the um, list. So, um, Commissioner Chun had asked, aside from the already mentioned alternatives, um, for balancing the budget for 2021, what other additional alternatives would you recommend? So I really think we've um, laid everything out there. Um, the recommended are in the decision packages and then the budget response report number three lays out some alternatives um, that um, could be substituted if um, council preferred to go that direction. Um, I've been thinking a lot um, in hindsight, um, it sure would have been nice through all this to have had that um, transactions and use tax with all of the um, 
online purchases being made. But I, I think at, at least for the time being, um, that ship has probably sailed. So, but no new alternatives. Um, the second question, if RBPAC has ongoing revenue of around 500,000 or less for each of the next three fiscal years, will there be consideration of not renewing, signing any new leases and allowing the RBPAC to shut down due to high operating costs? What is the current booking rate in number of days um, book for 2021? So, um, the RB PAC is um, one of those activities of the city that um, does not make money. It's um, a decision to be made. Is it worth having um, or making a subsidy to it um, to have the cultural entertainment venue? Um, so in order to help council make that decision each year, we do put in a um, mini financial or financial summary for the RB pack so that um, they can see exactly how much that um, subsidy um, is. So they can take a look and say, um, yeah, that's worth it or um, you know what, that just got too high and um, we don't think it's worth it anymore. So really it's just a, a call of counsel. If, of course, if you as a commission have a recommendation, um, I'm sure they're open to the input about that. Um, as far as the um, bookings, there is a um, budget response report, if I can follow my line budget response report number four that that talks about the bookings and the events scheduled to be there and all that. Arnie, uh, I believe Commissioner Chun had a question for you. Sure. Yeah, so I, I guess the co concern is not necessarily just this year, right, and especially with COVID-19 and just um, performing arts, whether it's sports, whether it's entering a restaurant, there's going to be reduced capacity. So in the event that it stays at half a million dollars or goes even further deficit, you know, million plus per year or extended, um, you know, it's, it's not a good thing to have certain things continue to go down in terms of <clears throat> whether it's expenses or the top line, the revenues. So that's just the concern, especially uh, 2020, uh, 2021, 2022, and then years out. That's all. Sure. And the current environment has shown us, you know, just because our, our hands were completely tied in the matter, it can be shut down. Um, it's just a, a call of whether it's, it's worth that much or not. Right. Thank you. So then um, we also got um, questions from um, Chairman Solomon and um, First one is, have we analyzed services we can contract out such as um, plan check? Um, so in the time we had, the um, only department I was able to, um, to get a hold of um, was in regards to plan check in our community development department. In that department, we are currently and have for the last um, several years, using a mixture of in-house staff and contract staff. Um, the in-house staff um, is at a minimum and um, provides the customer service that the um, public um, desires. Um, the, you know, they're here in City Hall, when City Hall's open, <laughs> um, during all business hours. So they're here to, to answer questions in person and, and all that. Whereas a um, contract service, um, somebody in community development is just going to um, take the plans in and send them off to, to the um, 
to the contractor. So what we use the um, contract services for are um, when the workload gets larger than the minimum staffing um, can handle. So they are more costly, but we're not paying for them when we're not using them. So this mixture of the two um, works quite well for us. Um, another department that I had reached out to but um, didn't get an answer from is Public Works. We are doing a um, mixture on, on custodial services as well. Um, and I'm not um, certain of the um, criteria for that, but um, City Hall, Police Department, um, I'm sure others are, um, the custodial services are provided by in-house staff, um, but the library, um, some of our um, park facilities, um, those are provided by a, a contract custodial service. So we do look for the opportunity and um, a, a lot of these are, are best served with a combination of the two. Is that something that's a professional services contract that the department heads are empowered to go ahead and secure Marnie? Or is that something that needs to go out for an RFP if they decide to do that? I think maybe I'll take that one, Marty. I think it depends on the circumstance. If it's a if it's a supplemental effort, and uh, for example, Peter, it was a time when uh, we didn't have potted plants and some of the enhanced uh, landscape thing that has been down there now for quite a few years. Uh, rather than have that added to our public works personnel existing kind of scope of responsibility and kind of further stretch their resources. We went out and got a specialty landscaper to help us maintain that, kind of keep that off our plate. So in a circumstance like that, the department has discretion, go out, seek pricing. Uh, it's in its supplemental service, they can do that. If it's a more holistic change where we, that might trigger, say, a meet and confer uh, process with uh, an association or, or union group that's historically provided that maintenance, uh, that one we would do probably would involve our office and we would do that a little more deliberately and with, with some consultation and input from the association themselves. Street sweeping, great example, right? Street sweeping used to be provided uh, by our, uh, our public works personnel uh, in the most recent contract amendment and extension with Athens Group will transition that service to them and then free up our employees to work on stormwater uh, maintenance obligations that were already burdening our crews. So we came to a nice resolution with our, our our union. We didn't lose personnel. We just freed them up to do other work. So it's sort of case by case. Okay, that makes sense because there are some portions of the budget where we're recommending contracting out services in order to save money and other parts of the budget where we're no longer going to contract out services right. in order to save right. money. Right. And just trying yeah. to figure out that's a department head that's doing that analysis uh, is it is it in the financial services department? What, what's the genesis of those things, and how are those decisions made? What's the yeah, point of the question? Yeah, yeah, totally understand that. And I think department heads certainly initiate the analysis. We might query. We might say, "How about this as an option?" Uh, finance city manager's office participates in that, and then there's really just more of a team review and an ultimate decision. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um. The next question, the council funded part two of the fire study for 24,000, but did not spend it. What happened to these funds? So um, at um, fiscal year end, um, after everything's closed, we're um, getting towards the end um, of our audit process and um, about ready to issue the financial statements we take to council. Um, where we um, ended up for the year and um, any excess funds, um, how they would like to assign it or just leave it in fund balance. And this 24000 is part of that, um, part of our year-end savings that, that we had. Um, so council's option, and of course they're, they're not spelled out as um, the savings came from this exact um, activity or or, um, or item, but um, it's handled one of those two ways. 
So that money is uh, put back into a has been put back into a pot since the council right. did not go forward with the second phase of the fire study. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And uh, would that same thing happen to monies from the storefront improvement program that haven't gotten used yet, or those um, would would still stay in the storefront improvement program? Um, so I know that on the storefront improvement program, um, if the grants have been, um, have been made, but, um, we have not written the check, um, for the reimbursement, those are set aside in a purchase order already, so they will carry over. Um, but if um, no um, no specifics to it exist, um, it it would be if the department needs to continue the program, they would request that um, they be able to to carry that money over um, without a specific request, the same thing happens. It just drops into fund balance. Okay, yeah, but right now with uh, a lot of places closed, if you're a building owner on Artesia and the, there's any funding there, it's a great opportunity while things are closed, you're not disrupting the businesses for the tenants inside. Okay, Very thank true. you, Marnie. Uh-huh. Um, next question was, um, any information available on the firefighters union position on planned cuts and changes? So that's part of um, negotiations with the um, union. So that's being done behind closed doors. Yeah, and I can, and I can say that we've had, uh, today was our fourth, uh, I think fourth meeting for discussion. So those are active conversations. Um, Thank you. So Mike's going to try and see if he can answer um, the Marine <laughs> Hotel Reserve and make it more clear than I did. <laughs> I did listen to your explanation uh, the other night. So uh, I'll, I'll hold off on um, asking an, another dumb question while you explain it again, please. <laughs> that's, a, that's all right. So I think the, the most simplistic way to look at it is, um, I mean, I guess I could go back, right? So Maybe Joe, I, I was listening to most of this. I think Joe and Marty both kind of described it this way. The, there was a lease lease back agreement executed with the developer. Um, and ultimately the, the developer's bank at the time of construction to get them over the finish line. It was a, it was a difficult time to procure financing. Um, and in an effort to try to uh, partner in that and, and get those hotels built. And you, you recall the old site was former city kind of temporary way station uh, coupled against, uh, you know, the former kind of mini golf and, and swim park. Uh, it's, it was in desperate need of redevelopment. Uh, so there was a partnership effort. The original transaction structure, structure was effectively a commitment by the city through the lease lease back arrangement for what's called a site specific tax pledge, um, an SSTP, where we committed uh, that any tax increment, any transient occupancy tax increment generated by the site uh, would initially be set aside in what's called an authority, and that's because it's the CFA that's holding it, the finance authority is holding uh, the, the lease lease back arrangement. Uh, the the uh, authority funded reserve would be uh, populated with tax increment up until uh, it reaches eight and a half million dollars. Once that money was in that account at its full, the city then would accrue tax increment on a go forward basis. Uh, big number, uh, and it took several years to, to basically uh, begin to fill uh, that fund. The, it set up effectively to protect the lender in the event that the developer begins to struggle on a expenditure and revenue basis and has risk of defaulting on the loan. And the, under specific, uh, and there's, uh, there's specific waterfall provisions and there's actually in the agreement an, a, a revenue expenditure worksheet that's an exhibit to the document that actually creates the pro forma by which they are enabled to trigger and use these funds. 
Um, of course, you think to yourself, what by goodness would actually re result in that? Because the initial analysis was you would effectively need sustained 40, 37 to 40% occupancy to really put at risk the fund. Well, here we are a few years later. The, it's, what is the scenario that creates that? A pandemic, right? I mean, this is a facility that was operating with 90% plus occupancy from day one. It is hummed from day one, it's been a flawless campus. It's been beautifully operated and constructed. Um, and I will say, and this isn't to pat all ourselves on the back, but thank goodness a few years back when they came to us for a refinancing, um, rather than just say, hey, all right, sounds good. Let's re we'll let you, uh, you know, achieve a better rate. Let's move forward. We stopped and, and uh, said, no, we, we need, if you're going to refinance this loan, we need to rethink the structure. And we were able to negotiate a reduction in the AFR from eight and a half million to three million. And candidly, have we not done that, um, they, it's likely given the pandemic, they would have scraped out by the end of it, the majority of that eight and a half million, and we would be spending the next three to four years putting it back. So this year, um, unfortunately, we're going to have to put back the better part of the three million or all of it. Um, so we are anticipating zero TOT from those three Marine Avenue hotels in our TOT projections, because mm -hmm. the money that will come back will go right to that fund. Okay, uh, that, that was the substance of the question, Mike. Um, there is, it, so we, we recover or we receive TOT from the hotel. It gets paid into our general fund, and then we are um, booking it back to the hotels to replenish that $3 million reserve. Yeah, and really, we're actually booking it in a way we're sending the check to the bank. So okay. a bank holds the fund. We get regular statements. Uh, we get the TOT, and then we, in this case, which is first time it's happened, we then remit the TOT uh, to the fund uh, and payback. What they're able to do initially is they're able to demonstrate to us via the worksheet that they're first able to access the fund. So the bank draws from the account, but to your question, the replenishment would come, they remit them to us and then we'd pay them to, to restore the fund. So the, the question ends up being then for me, uh, we anticipate the estimate from staff, uh, from your analysis is that we'll receive $5.8 million less in TOT in the next fiscal. Is that 5.8 million reflecting the $3 million that we're replenishing? And it, it it is yeah so but for the replenishment we would we would be expecting not five eight but probably well let me maybe look at this a different way the campus generates about three million a year in tot we would and I, we're i think saying 50 percent performance really aggregate if it's much more refined than that but on the whole for simplicity's sake we're expecting hotels to perform at 50 percent of prior levels this next fiscal year. Um, it's, it starts slower and ramps up, et cetera. But if, if you take that same math to the Marine Avenue hotel site, we would have anticipated generating $1.5 million from that campus that would have been additive to our current $2.8 million projection for the full city. So it would have clawed back some of that five plus million dollar reduction. Um, we, wouldn't have, we wouldn't be projecting the full three million um, but we would be projecting some portion of that. And unfortunately, we can't project any portion of that because that call is going to go straight to the bank. Yeah, so in our normal year, uh, well, in our hi recent history, uh, our annual TOT was right around 8.9 yeah. million. So I was trying to reflect the idea or understand the idea of whether or not the 5.8 hit is that we got the TOT, and then we send it back or how, how that was getting booked or how it was being reflected in the potential for loss. Yeah, right. And I think, the, and it's reflected, I think the simple way to do it is if you, if eight, nine is our peak or maybe even further simplicity, nine was our peak, but for the replenishment, we would have projected four and a half but because we're not getting, because we can't, we have to do the replenishment. We're taking another million and a half off of that number. Okay. So the number is maybe not the $3 million replenishment that we're taking the hit on but the 1.6 or so that you're describing now. Yeah, exactly.
Okay, that makes that makes more sense to me then. I I appreciate the explanation. Thank you. Yeah. Pains me to pains me to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Next question is um, about Joe's Crab Shack. Director Proud indicated Joe's want out of their lease. Are the estimates in the harbor of 1.2 million in lease revenue and 1.6 million in percentage of gross receipts? inclusive of a vacant Joe's Crab Shack or considering Joe's is occupied. And I, I did check with him and um, their revenue estimates because um, Joe's can't just unilaterally um, get out of the lease, does um, consider Joe's is occupied. But uh, I thought the agreement that we had made uh, with them, uh, when we reformed the lease earlier, uh, or last year was that they could be out of the lease in September or October. They could exercise an option to, to leave. They can. So what this really boils down to is they, they owe us, although everybody's deferring rent right now, they technically would owe us under the structure of the lease rent through to September, October, I forget the month, I think it's the end of September. Um, but for the fact that everybody is deferring currently. So we would attempt to collect the deferred rent and I'm hopeful that they'll make a payment before September, but September will be the end of our expectation. Yeah, and since uh, everyone's being deferred right now, then it's reflected in the numbers that Director Proud mentioned then. Yeah. Okay, um, and that include uh, other places like the Cheesecake Factory down there? Was it inclusive of all the leases? Yeah, yes. I mean, it, the master lessees are, are, are operating and behaving a little differently. Um, but yes, I mean, all the revenue projections we have this next fiscal year expect, um, anticipate some, in some respect, we expect some deferred rent remittance, right? Some repayment next fiscal year for la this current fiscal year's money. Some of that hopefully will be booked against 1920. It may not, depending on timing. Um, and that would even include, because recently one of the leases down there, I think was sold um, uh, for the uh, harbor for the boat slips and uh, that right. area of the harbor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we, they're, they're, and unfortunately where we're probably heading with most of these lessees is some level of kind of workout, right. For the, for re collection of the deferred rent. Uh, right. You know, I, I doubt any of them will really be in a position to write us three months worth of rent back to rent at any one time. So there's going to be a lot more conversation on this. If you attempted to write uh, to add those um, those months onto the back end of the leases, would that be something that has to go through the council? Um, if it were, well, yeah, I think so. If, to codify that structurally, yes, it would be an amendment. If it's if if they're playing catch up within, say, a single uh, fiscal year, we have a little flexibility in the way we just account for lease revenue. So, and of course we would do that with council's knowledge through our, you know, lease negotiation conversations, but, um, but yeah, anything that would result in some level of extension or, or back end amortization, anything that would be materially different than the lease structure as drafted would, would require an amendment. Okay. Thank you. And the next question is about the estimated shortfall. Estimated shortfall is 8.9 million in the general fund with another 4 million for Harbor Enterprise funds. Is this, if all decision packages are accepted, um, what is the estimated worst case number? Um, so no, this is before um, decision packages. Oh, okay. The decision packages are accepted, then it brings us to, um, to zero. Um, we, oh. we have a shortfall on the general fund side we get to general balance. fund yes on the uplands and tideland side we get we drop roughly two million dollar deficits if all decision packages were accepted to something like 1.1 million in each fund or thereabouts so if uh, some of the decision packages aren't accepted and we're running a deficit in the tidelands is that something where if we dip into that fund we have to go to state lands commission for over two hundred fifty thousand dollars to get their permission to do that? No, because we would effectively be drawing on it via payroll and operations on a on a scheduled basis. We um, so no, it would just be we would be drawing down uh, 
every time we make payroll. So okay. um, we wouldn't, but but we would have to draw from that fund balance, and uh, ultimately we would have to revise the projections for um, you know what we would anticipate having available for capital and everything else in future years for sure. If uh, if the decision packages, let's say for the tidelands and the uplands, were not adopted uh, as as requested, then that four million dollar number would be could be different. It, uh, yeah, well, it would stay at four million. It would stay at four million. It'll stay at four million, and we'll deficit spend to the tune of two million in each of those funds. If they accept them, we'll we'll deficit spend to a lesser amount. <laughs> gotcha. Okay, thank you. I don't know if that that works, but yeah. And so, follow up to that: Can we absorb losses in the Tidelands Uplands for one year and not downstaff the Harbor Patrol um, boat? And yeah, we can we can absorb losses in the tidelands uh, for the year. Uplands is a different story. Uplands is much more constrained. Um, we have far less flexibility there. We we are projecting deficit spending for the the year, as I've said. Um, we can't do that very long in the uplands. Okay, thank you. And the next question, do we have an explanation as to why the self-insurance fund has a $10 million um, dollar negative balance? And um, all day today has been spent writing that budget response report okay. to the council and then um, asked for that as well. So um, those should be available um, tomorrow evening and um, we'll send that out to you. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, do we expect funds or grants to the city may be rescinded or downsized? Um, so we talked about that for a little bit with Mike on the um, CIP side, which um, honestly is where most of our, our grants are, are used. Um, there is a budget response report um, about transit funding, um, budget response report number five. And um, that um, talks about how, yes, our transit funds are likely to get reduced, um, but we don't know the magnitude at this point. Um, what is the cost impact per year to service the debt of the Fisherman's Co lease? And I wasn't um, quite sure about that question. Is that just the portion of the debt attributed to Fisherman's Cove or the- Yes, it, yes, it was, Marnie. And, and I saw that in the blue folder um, uh, budget response reports that came in today, that question was answered awesome. at uh, 1.65 million uh, awesome. per year for the $9 million portion of just associated with that portion of the refinance. Well, cool. to be clear, it's the that the one six five per year is the full twenty seven million dollar bond. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it would be a third of that, effectively. So a third of the a third of the total debt service yeah. of one point six five would be a, a back of the envelope way of figuring yeah. what the debt service is of the refi yeah. of the purchase of the Fisherman's Cove lease. Yeah, it's not exact, but it's for you know for simplicity's sake, that's it's a fair. Roughly a third. Okay, thank you. That that answers the question. Thank you. Next question is, can we list the actual cost of overtime expenses related to the fire department in overtime rather than counting on the unfilled positions to fund this possible expense? This would be more transparent and an accurate representation. So when it comes to budgeting, um, Un unless a position is deauthorized or defunded, the plan is to um, fill that vacancy. Um, and in the case, you know, with a firefighter or, or another fire um, staff member. And um, so that's why it, it's budgeted there. That really is the intent is to, um, to fill that vacancy. When it comes to the actual expenditures, we do record it exactly where it was spent. Um, we record it to overtime if it was um, 
if the position were being filled um, by somebody else on overtime instead of the vacancy itself being filled. So, so um, if I understood um, the way you explained it last time, Marnie, or in our previous meeting, it was that uh, the funds that are there, and I'm just maybe restating what you said in a different way, the funds that are there for the vacant positions can be used to uh, apply towards overtime requirements. When with our current proposal uh, in the decision packages, it's recommended that those five vacant firefighter positions are defunded. And so maybe uh, in this case, would it be something since those are defunded that you wouldn't be able to do it in the manner in which it was described last time, or that's not an issue, that's not how it gets booked? Right, you wouldn't be able to, and that's why that decision package is, goes on to address the constant manning number with, uh, um, is it truck? I think, Mike. Yeah, it's the ladder truck. So ladder truck. It, we're looking. At, right. It, it has to be done in conjunction with the reduction in um, required staffing. And you might have a situation where, if you do downstaff the Harbor Patrol, those employees are being reassigned or assigned into the fire department. So you might have a situation where those five positions look like two positions for the three employees that are moving out of the Thailands and out of the Harbor Patrol boat and into the fire stations themselves, the other, the other two fire stations. Yeah, and to, and to maybe put a finer point on that, the, the positions that would be theoretically transferred if we did reduce by a third the staffing in Harbor Patrol, it's one captain position and one HPO, which is effectively the equivalent of the paramedic. So the, the captain would transfer into a vacant captain position, the HPO would transfer into a vacant paramedic, uh, position in general operations, um, if it's approved, as, as I've said, I, I suspecting it won't be approved, but if that were the case to those two positions in the fire vacancies currently would be filled with these transfers. I guess the point I was uh, looking to make is that we're budgeting $2 million for overtime when our experience, especially in the last few years and with a dramatic increase in hours, which is another question that I had are reflecting a bigger number than the 2 million. I would want to reflect that as part of the budget uh, for, for purposes of transparency to say, we think it's gonna be 2 million when we know it's gonna be higher it is maybe not the best way I think to display it to the public. But if uh, you reduce that constant manning number, then the overtime should not rise to that $2 million level again. So if, if let's say the decision packages for the down staffing of the ladder truck and the MOU uh, modification that comes along with that and the uh, down staffing of the Harbor Patrol boat, if those two things don't happen, then would you be revising the estimated $2 million in overtime charge in that category? It, it, assuming we then didn't also fill those positions, uh, yes. I mean, if, if we don't achieve... Um, if we don't achieve, well, I should, maybe I should answer this two ways. We would eventually, I don't know if we would take the action uh, immediately in payroll to reflect that change. We might do that at mid-year or some other time to actually track the number to know. Uh, okay. Because there are a lot of factors that drive over time that um, our constant staffing requirements are clearly the, is the largest factor. But then there's, there's injuries, there's leave utilization of a variety of types. So other things can drive that number um, differently each year, not just the vacancies themselves. The vacancies clearly contribute, but it's not the only variable. Um, so in the scenario you describe, if we weren't able to achieve the meet and confer um, agreement, we uh, would reflect and the budget would reflect anticipated savings at some point during the year, we would evaluate whether or not we should adjust the overtime based on trending or um, it, would we still hit our savings by having it loaded in payroll and then not expense. Maybe I'm just being pessimistic and our hopes for the meet and confer portion of it, knowing that you can't talk about it, but uh, the firefighters union has uh, a, fair Stabers a Fair Standards Labor Act lawsuit against us 
against the city. Um, we haven't had a contract with them for two years. We're operating under the other MOU. Um, we asked them in 2011, was it maybe 2009 to take a pay cut. Um, they, we, we lost at fact finding. Uh, we've, we've taken, we, we've had a lot of um, back and forth with that particular union and to ask them for some concessions right now. And maybe I'm just being pessimistic about it uh, to see that. And so I was just hoping to get, I expect that we're going to have the overtime, you know, far better than I do, certainly. But um, that's why I was asking to see it reflected there. Yeah. And, and listen, I, I mean, the, the history is what it is. I mean, I, you, you recited it well. Um, we've had uh, very positive conversations with, with uh, our fire association. Um, we are looking uh, both, both the, both groups are looking forward, uh, trying to look forward, not backwards. Um, and, uh, you know, I remain personally very hopeful that we'll come to some form of agreement. Um, and uh, all I can say is our conversation has been very positive and we're working very hard uh, to, uh, to kind of move, move forward as an organization uh, with the association. So well, I'm really glad uh, to I'm hear optim that. I'm optimistic. Okay. Well, I'm really glad yeah. to hear that. Uh, yeah. Commissioner Samples has a question, please. Um, yes, thank you. Um, just to be clear, and and without getting into the discussions about labor negotiations or anything else, um, let's not talk about the um, the budget items that are on the list for the fire department in isolation. There are three of them out there that effectively um, impact the service that the fire department can provide to the city of Redondo Beach. We're talking about taking one personnel off the fire truck. We're talking about taking a captain and engineer off engine two in station two and putting them on a rescue. Rescues don't carry water and they're not capable of fighting fires. And we're talking about taking two personnel out of the harbor and redeploying them elsewhere in the city. This is pretty dramatic in a department as, uh, as small as ours. And um, I am really not happy with that combination of uh, budget response reports and recommendations. So um, for what it's worth, I just want to be on the record. We're talking three items here, significant impact to the service to the citizens. And, and just to be clear, Commissioner, and, and all three of those are, are, are part and parcel of this conversation. The one thing I want to make clear is the decision package um, reflects only the changes in HPO, in the Harbor Patrol functions we discussed, and then the recommended change in the ladder truck servicing and staffing. The, what you're referring to is the engine conversion to rescue. That's an alternative, that's an alternative concept that's not in the recommended budget, just to be clear. Um, uh, my only point is for, for the folks that don't understand what we're talking about in, in fire department operations, there are standards for how many people it takes and how many pieces of apparatus it takes in order to fight a particular fire. And as it stands right now with the staffing that we have today, if we have a residential fire in Redondo Beach and we, and we can't reach out to Torrance uh, or, or the county to help us, we will have every piece of apparatus in our city with the exception of one rescue on that one fire. And we need to pray that there's not another incident while those guys are on the fire. And that's the minimum staffing to get to a fire. So the fact that our response plan absolutely depends and, and requires that we have mutual aid from other departments, I think is a real problem with the way we're managing that department and we're managing that budget. So enough said. Thank you. And thank you, Marnie, for uh, answering the questions. I think we're, I don't see any more hands. If you want to please move to the next one. Okay. The next one is about the hours that you mentioned. Please explain in more detail how 39,000 hours in the fire department is expected in next fiscal year from last fiscal. What were we doing wrong before? How was this discovered? When was this discovered? So it's really just the document that, um, the um, the correction needs to be made. Um, so if I can share my screen here, and in our next batch of um, budget response reports, we'll do a correction to the hours and then um, show this. So 
So um, the way it is currently shown in the budget document, um, the personnel that work 24 hour shifts is um, calculated as if it worked what I called regular shifts. So instead of um, 2,912 hours a year, which they actually work, it's shown in the budget document as if they were, were only working 2,080. So that, that is just incorrect. So we will um, correct that to show it the way it should be, which matches up with the way it is in 2021 because the personnel count has not changed, at least in the core budget. And so these um, 61 personnel who work 24-hour um, shifts um, will be shown at their 2,912 hours, um, and then the six admin continue to be shown at their 2,080 hours. So we have the total hours of 190,112, and um, here's the breakdown between the three categories that you've been adding up, the core service, the key project, and the customer service for the total of 191.12, which is the same as 2021. So it, it didn't, nothing about the hours changed. It's just shown incorrectly in the budget document. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, can we suspend payment into an ISF fund? Harbor Commission is suggesting suspending one year of payments into vehicle replacement fund. So actually that's exactly what um, uh, our couple of our decision packages ask us to do. Um, the information technology equipment replacement fund, um, is suggested just that way that um, we don't charge departments for one year and then the vehicle we charge 50% for two years. So if you weren't changing your replacements then, no, you couldn't do that because you, you don't have the money set aside to do it. But what we've done in conjunction with the suspension of the charges is to um, put the equipment replacements out a year. So um, we're, we're still fully funded by the time it gets to, to replacement time. Um, and then the last question, can we reduce hours of operation for the police marine enforcement unit rather than the harbor patrol operations? So you have a um, couple of budget response reports um, that are um, being finalized um, and um, they, um, one deals with the harbor patrol side and one deals with um, the um, activity that the police marine enforcement unit has has seen. So those should um, help to answer that question. Okay, thank you, Marnie. And that's all the questions we, we had received. Okay, uh, at this juncture, I'd uh, ask the commission, if, based on what we've heard so far, if there are any additional questions at this time, I don't see any hands up. Uh, my recommendation, not seeing any hands. Uh, Eleanor, can we hear from the public, please, if there are any comments? Sure. Yeah, we have about, I think, seven e comments. Go ahead, Vicki. Okay. The first comment uh, is submitted by Greg Ronkinen. I strongly oppose any cuts to the Harbor Patrol that are not in the line in line with other departments. There is a life safety issue and would create a huge liability to the city. Submitted by Marcy Klein, I strongly oppose any cuts to the Harbor Patrol. As a stand-up paddler and boater, we rely upon the Harbor Patrol to keep us and others safe on the water. Submitted by Casey Coonan, I strongly oppose any cuts to the Harbor Patrol. We need them for further our, to further, excuse me, we need them for further our safety out on the water. That's as written. 
from Norm Thorne. I strongly oppose any cuts to our harbor patrol. Cuts could harm public safety on the water. Any reduction would also make us look bad to the Coastal Commission when, excuse me, when proposing any future changes because of our own failure to support our harbor now. Submitted by Joel Schaefer as a res resident of Redondo Beach for over 38 years and an avid boater in King Harbor for all those years, I strongly oppose to any cut or reduction for the budget of the Harbor Patrol. The Harbor Patrol provides a much needed public safety to all citizens, resident and visitors to Redondo Beach and our coastal waters. I also believe any cuts would open up our city to liability and, and potential lawsuits. Submitted by Steve Davis, I am strongly in opposition to any reduction in Harbor Patrol staffing. I have been a boater in King Harbor for over 15 years and have found the Harbor Patrol to provide a vital service to boaters. They have kept our harbor safe and secure. If you, if you need additional funds to support the Harbor Patrol, I would suggest eliminating the police patrol. They are not boaters and have been an unwelcome addition to the harbor. And lastly, from Steve Fechner, Please do not eliminate the Harbor Patrol. They are an essential part of the safety and security of the harbor. In the 40 years that I have been boating in King Harbor, they saved me and my boat twice from circumstances beyond my control. Please keep the funding for the Harbor Patrol. And that concludes public comment. Okay. Thank you, Vicki. You're welcome. Uh, so at this, uh, at this juncture, uh, what I recommend is uh, that the commissioners weigh in on any of the decision packages or any other items that they may like to see uh, modified or addressed in our recommendations to city council. Um, I know uh, Commissioner Johnson is working on a, on a tight time schedule. So um, Steve, I'd ask uh, if you don't mind uh, weighing in on things that you'd like to, on uh, any decision packages that you'd like to see addressed or comments that you'd like to make or any other part of the budget, please. Well, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the seven comments just made by the public uh, regarding the Harbor Patrol. So, you know, I, I, I think that's my main area of focus. And, and, and I don't really have the, the data or the background to uh, make a conclusion as to the extent that that will create a, a dangerous condition or if there's less people you know boating in the harbor right now um, i think boating is probably something people can do um, to to the extent that the beach is open the harbor is open we're allowing people to do that um, i don't know that we're going to have that much of a um, proportional decrease in volume of activity so uh, i i open that up to everyone for discussion because i don't have a recommendation but I, I'm, I'm very interested and sympathetic to the concept that um, you know a boater or a swimmer in trouble is is a really something that we, we may want to avoid so over to others okay thank you for that um, I'd uh, I'd agree with them um, with the comments and with Commissioner Johnson uh, it brings us back to the question and there was a recommendation from the Harbor Patrol, while maybe not an ideal situation, while we're watching the COVID-19 unfold, uh, would we be willing as a commission to recommend to the city council that they, A, simply not downstaff the Harbor Patrol or, and absorb the costs in as a deficit to the Tidelands for the year, or recommend that we cut in some other area or some other idea that the commission might have in order to account for that difference uh, in decision package 29 is what we're talking about. And Mike um, or Marnie, please correct me, but it looks like the reduced staffing and operations is to save $543,742. Yes. And I, I don't recall offhand if that also included the savings, Marnie, from the, the civilian position that we're rotating out, or was that inclusive of that? Or was that specific to just the, the deputy harbor, the boat captain in HPO? You're, you're muted, Marty. No, that um, staff person is in um, the- The other decision package. Decision package. Okay, so that's specific to the one third reduction. So yeah, you're fully right. Uh, 
Yeah, that it would be that figure that we're dealing with, and exclusively the Tidelands. And it would specifically be the Tidelands, you said, Mike? Yes, yes. Okay. And uh, as mentioned earlier, and I, I just, I don't mm -hmm. want to uh, hammer the point away too hard, but um, it appears as though we would be able to deficit spend for that amount for a year within the Tidelands. You mentioned more so in the Tidelands than the Uplands, and we would not otherwise be restricted by a regulator such as the State Lands Commission from doing that. Would that be the council's choice upon recommendations that were made? Yes, and, and that's come up in our conversations at our council hearings as well. Is that an option? Um, and and that, that remains an option. That is an option to council uh, and certainly this commission at, via recommendation that um, instead of uh, accepting decision package 29, uh, we would otherwise recommend to council effectively spend the commensurate amount out of the existing fund balance in lieu of the cut. Uh, any of the other commissioners want to weigh in on a, an idea here with regard to decision package 29 uh, for the Harbor Patrol item? Uh, Gene, I, uh, <clears throat> I agree with the comments that, that it's dangerous to, to reduce that amount. We talked about this at the last meeting. There are two, two issues. One is the, just the safety of the people who might be sacrificed because we don't have uh, adequate staff there. I recall someone making comment that uh, there would be some time during the week when uh, the phone would be dark and that people would not be able to uh, even get someone on the phone to uh, to uh, register an alert. Uh, and I think this that sort of a situation, if it's true, if I am, if my understanding is correct, then I'm even more concerned because in addition to the the public safety issue, I think you get a real issue with liability for the city. If you create a situation where you simply delay or make the, the service a little less, uh, you can get by. But if, if someone gets hurt and on the day when the, the phone is dark and they, they can't even be re reached for, for service, uh, I wouldn't like to be defending that in court because I think, I think the, the city can, can be uh, liable for a, a huge amount of money. Not, a, not an attorney, so I, that, that could be wrong, but if I were sitting on the jury uh, hearing that issue, I'd be inclined to vote for them. So I think that's an issue we need to be concerned about. Okay, uh, I think your points are well taken. I would agree with that. Uh, no, it's a, a known condition. Uh, they would be able to go back and demonstrate the number of responses on any given day, any month, any, any year, and show that leaving it dark put, us, uh, put the people at a higher risk uh, than otherwise. Uh, Mike or, uh, or Marnie, um, are, there other, uh, are there other agencies that can cover us or that would cover us uh, if we were dark for a period of time? We would have to, uh, there, there is an option of such thing. We would have to go explore that formally. Uh, you all are familiar with the uh, county uh, lifeguards who also operate out of station three, um, their primary of uh, their sole responsibility is outside the breakwater. They do not provide services currently inside the harbor. That falls to our uh, function. Uh, there could be conversations to explore uh, some kind of a partnership agreement with them or the like, but we would need to contractual, we would need to create an agreement, uh, a relationship for them to cover theoretically any dark hours. As an example, Harbor Patrol historically uh, was a, primarily a daytime operation. Uh, this is this predates its time even in the fire department. There's a time when it actually was supervised by a harbor master who reported to the harbor department director, uh, and it was uh, staffed with non-safety personnel, civilian employees at the time. Um, they had different status, and, and they and the law was different about safety and sworn and things, but. They, they were primarily a daytime operation. They did overlap hours uh, to work into the evenings in peak months, uh, but they did not have 24 seven staffing. They moved away from that model in the early nineties when they uh, fell underneath the banner of the fire department. Uh, that was one of the draws to, to moving out of Harbor into fire because there was that 24 seven opportunity. Um, and it is interesting when you look at their calls for service and it's too bad we don't have that uh, BRR for you uh, yet completed, um, but there there is there is some interesting data in the statistics, and 
when we do receive typical calls for service um, versus self-initiated calls and, and, and the time of year, et cetera. And that will be eventually provided. You'll receive it this weekend when the council gets it in their packet. Uh, and, and you should take a look at it. But um, we would, to, to get back to your question, we would have to uh, formally explore an arrangement with uh, county uh, lifeguards to see if they could backfill effectively or supplement our service if we were to actually remove staffing or reduce staffing at the site. So then in addition to any MOU modification, we would have to make with that, that um, uh, the union for the fire department, we'd also have to Correct. make an agreement with county. Correct. Oh. Or yeah, somebody else theoretically. Yes. Or somebody. Okay. Commissioner Samples has a question, please. Um, thank you. Um, absolutely good point, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. These things that we're talking about are not things that we can implement on July 1st so that we can recognize the savings immediately through the course of this next fiscal year. So part of the savings are kind of speculative. But I think part of the problem that we have here with the uh, with Fire Station 3 and with the, the Harbor Patrol is once upon a time, the fireboat was unmanned except if there was a fire in the harbor and then Fire Station 1 drove down and manned the fireboat. We have now created a fire station and we've created an expectation and a level of service within the harbor and trying to take it away, I think is extremely difficult. I, th I think it, it places us um, in, in a very bad situation trying to take it away without a good alternative plan in place before we make the recommendation to move forward with it. So that's my comment. Thank you. Okay, uh, seems like uh, uh, absent uh, hearing from the other commissioners, there seems to be a consensus uh, for the public and from the commissioners who have spoken so far that, that we would not be recommending uh, decision package 29 would be adopted. Uh, would the commissioners, commissioners wish be that we simply uh, message the council that we would not like to see it adopted or that you would like to not see it adopted and go ahead and deficit spend for the, for at least one year or just simply leave it open at the council's discretion. Certainly the recommendation that we, we cover it one way or the other. So uh, if, deficit, if deficit spending is the only way to do that, then that would be a part of, of what I think we should should recommend. But Sort of a one-time uh, one solution to that problem uh, while we watch as the uh, pandemic unfolds. Right, right. Uh, so I think um, uh, let's go ahead and uh, include that, please, Marty, that we would, as a commission, I have uh, item number 29 not adopted as a decision package and to absorb as a deficit spend within the Tidelands uh, for one year, uh, that item. I, I don't think we should earmark exactly where the funds come from. I think the, the problem that the city is having with the budget is complex enough that we should leave that open for the city council and our, our city manager and our finance office to figure out it may be some combination of funds or methods. Um, but I, I don't think we should specifically pick a, a fund that it should come from. Okay. That sounds fine. Let's do simply do it that we would elect not to adopt decision package 29 then please. I, I agree with uh, commissioner samples on that. And I believe that uh, if we get the additional data, regarding the statistics that would be significantly better, a more informed decision uh, in terms of the analysis. And so if we don't adopt the uh, the budget response, then yeah, just leave it up to city council and staff to um, best figure out how to um, make up that deficit. Okay. Um, Commissioner, uh, one, when did one, you have one, something? One other thing along that, right? I mean, we like to talk about safety, so we got to always keep in mind safety is typically three, right? Harbor, police, fire, and other first responders. So it's very difficult to, um, very, it's always challenging because of the MOUs and the, the safety involved with, um, with the residents. And so it's always challenging, with the, especially with those three uh, departments. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, and in terms of balancing a budget, it's even further challenged by the fact that our safety operations are two thirds of our expenditure. <laughs> so um, it's hard to hold safety harmless and still effectuate balancing and cuts when, um, you know, it's not something most of our residents want to see occur. So it's a, it, it becomes a kind of a dual edged sword there. And uh, and to put it in some further perspective, 
you know, we have a $2 million deficit in the Tidelands this year. Harbor Patrol operations itself as a function is, is effectively roughly a $2 million a year expense. It's a big number. I mean, by far the biggest staff number um, in the Tidelands uh, fund. I don't see any other hands. Um, so um, Commissioner Johnson, did you have any the other budget response reports or uh, comments that you'd like to see recommended to the council? I think that's the one I wanted to uh, to address, and I, and I don't and I don't want to uh, give a further speech on the topic. But um, you know, we are representing Redondo Beach, and and one of our primary attractions is King Harbor, and you know, and to uh, Commissioner Woodham's comment about um, you know the term is creating an attractive nuisance. Uh, you know, we're drawing people in, we're inviting people in, and uh, looking for the for the long term. Uh, we, we don't want to do anything that would damage the reputation. So just putting in, um, you know, more of a, th this is a long-term thing is to not damage anything that would affect the safety of um, the Harbor area. Thank you. Agreed. Uh, as a tie-in, perhaps uh, would the commission like to discuss whether or not then to adopt uh, decision package 15 which would also request of the fire department to make a modification. It was a down staff or reduced staffing on the ladder truck. Uh, Commissioner Samples had some comments with regard to staffing requirements last time. Uh, we all came together, uh, specifically the two in and two out. And I don't know if that ended up getting resolved or not, but um, I would open up the floor to the idea of whether or not to request that item 15 be adopted or not, since we're talking about staffing and the fire department. I don't see any hands, so we'll go ahead and table that. Um, I'll go ahead and uh, go around the bend then and see what other yes, items sir. the commissioners would like to either recommend not to adopt or to recommend yes. uh, adopting or changing. Uh, Commissioner um, Chun, did you have any other items uh, from the decision packages or the budget you'd like to discuss? No, I mean, it's basically just the questions I had already uh, that I submitted the last two meetings. Okay. Um, uh, Commissioner Chair, Samples has his hand up. Yeah, you, you missed my hand earlier. Sorry about that. Um, I, I probably was putting up right at the time that you were looking and missed it. Um, yeah, with respect to um, uh, removing that um, uh, firefighter from, from the truck company. Um, I would recommend against that uh, um, decision package. Um, actually, it, it occurs to me that what we're doing here is we're running short in our department with personnel and rather than filling those places and, and going back to your original question about overtime, rather than filling those spots with young, new, happy, willing firefighters um we're finding ways to redeploy the firefighters that we have so that the the vacancies aren't so onerous and that net result is that we end up with pieces of apparatus out of service um so i, I would very much recommend against that uh, decision package commissioner samples is, is there a middle ground position on this if i'm if i'm reading this uh, the decision package uh, retains as vacant five positions and removes the one position that you object to, correct? Um, well, it it's a redeploying of a person. So it's like we have a human right now that's assigned to slot number four on the truck company. And we don't have enough personnel to fill all the other positions within the department. So we're taking that person off the truck company, making it a three person piece of apparatus and moving them over to an engine company. So we're not really getting a new person. We're just playing musical chairs with the people that we have because those slots haven't been filled. And well, can, can I maybe commissioner, could I just interrupt you for one quick second to put a little bit more detail to that? So what, what we have right now with the ladder truck in particular, is we have a, a constant staffing requirement in the aggregate of 19 uh, in our department. Four of the 19 are dedicated to the ladder truck. 
which is made up of a captain, an engineer, and two firefighter positions. Right. This happening right now um, is those firefighter positions are not currently filled with firefighters. They are vacant. Regardless of vacancy, I, I think you did mention this, those positions, the 19, the two firefighter spots, have to be filled right now on an operations basis. They're being filled by paramedics on an overtime basis. So the way we effectuate the savings is via the meet and confer process to where we no longer have the obligation to fill both of those firefighter positions, which in practice right now due to the vacancies is via a, a paramedic, but rather than two, we only have to fill one of the two. And it's still the same personnel. We're using paramedics within the operation who uh, may otherwise work on other units, uh, but for this overfill assignment uh, on an overtime basis. So we still continue to provide and deploy 19 captains down to firefighters in some form or fashion at all times, 24 seven. The worry becomes absent the minimum staffing adjustment and Commissioner Samples has touched on this, there becomes a little bit of burnout because we're now asking paramedics to work their regular shifts and then backfill the vacant firefighter positions on an overtime basis. So um, good for overtime pay, uh, you know, bad for fatigue, right? So that's the worry. So if we reduce the constant staffing obligation, um, we only have to fill one of those two current vacant spots. Uh Maybe you know, more fine point, it takes six firefighters, six FTE, full-time equivalent budgeted firefighters to fully staff those two firefighter positions on the ladder on a 24-7 basis. Well, actually it takes nine because you have to accommodate overtime or you have to accommodate vacations and injuries and sick time and all those. Well, it would be nice to have nine. Six has worked for us. Six has worked for us to meet the obligation comfortably, but yeah. it, it yeah. can get thin. Yes. So three shifts of two people is six, but you have to accommodate time off. So um, I, I get how that staffing works. Let, let's not beat this one to death. Um, however, the, the commission and the city council would like to move on this. Um, fortunately, um, it's it's not my decision, um, but I just, I fundamentally don't like it. Could, um, could we have it where uh, we agreed with the idea to uh, deauthorize the um, administrative specialist position, but uh, not to uh, change the other component of the uh, decision package item. You can always make that recommendation. That might be uh, a compromise if you were concerned about uh, somebody being available to get hired in. But um, if I understand it correctly, we're, we're defunding those five vacant positions um, is that inclusive there of this this decision package? Yes. That position is separate. The specialist position is a, comp a component of the overall decision package. So, and you could certainly give advice to suggest, hey, we like that portion of it, but we don't like, say, this portion of it. We don't like the idea of holding vacancies, um, but we are okay with if you can achieve agreement with meet and confer for the temporary reduction, you know, the reduction of staffing, you could do any one of those things, or you could say, Hey, we just don't like the decision package at all. We'd advise you not to accept it, seek alternative savings. You, you, you know, sky's the limit. You can really do any or all of those things. Okay. So consider that when we're reviewing whether or not to make this recommendation to council on item 15, please, uh, for everyone. Uh, Commissioner Woodham, did you have a, uh, uh, Mr. Samples, your hand back up again, or is that from before? Hold on. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Woodham, did you have any of the decision packages that you wanted to weigh in on or make recommendation on? Nothing on the decision packages, but one one question just to refresh my memory, and this to, to Marnie or Mike. In the forecast of uh, revenue uh, for um, fiscal 2021, remind me of, of what the general idea was there. Uh, are they Was the forecast expecting... Uh, a decline from the first infection and a gradual buildup over the, the next fiscal year. Uh, I assume they did not anticipate a second uh, major bout with, uh, with uh, COVID-19. Uh, it doesn't change anything except I'm just curious to, to know what was behind our forecast going forward in case the question comes up. 
Yes, we, we anticipated, we actually anticipated a lingering possible second spike in the summer that would hamper, uh, and I'll speak specifically to TOT right now, that would hamper hotel stays this summer. So we, we forecasted a, a, fair, a very conservative summer occupancy rate in the 25, 30% number. We then projected gradual increase in the fall and winter um, that we aggregated out at roughly 50. And then we thought spring would be likely some more aggressive push towards normal, uh, normal ADR, average daily rates, as well as occupancy. So we, we thought that summer could continue to be problematic. A more optimistic individual might say, well, maybe we get a spike uh, of uh, demand and actual travelers in July, and then it has to pull back as they get more cautious again uh, about the virus, but we didn't we didn't get into that fine point. We just we felt that summer was going to be you know a quarter or less than a third of normal. Uh, fall and, and winter might be a fifty percent of normal, and the spring might be seventy percent of normal. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Commissioner Wynn, did you have any of the decision packages or budget comments uh, that you'd like to make? A uh, couple items. Um, I'm in agreement with item 29, no reduction in the Harbor Patrol. Um, but we've, we've talked enough about that, so I'll go to the next one. Uh, question on decision package number 31, Seaside Lagoon. So it looks like here there's no water operations for the rest of the year, correct? It's just we're going to rent it out to summer camps or, or facility use? Yeah, very. What we, you know, whatever ultimately we can do within COVID restrictions and we anticipate being very uh, kind of small group gatherings, maybe small camp activity towards the tail end of the summer. And really what this decision package does is it acknowledges the, the reality that our core budget anticipates with water operations, 600 plus thousand annualized revenue and rough, you know, something just short of that in annualized expenses, but we're not going to get those revenues. And, by way of this decision package is this recommendation, we're trimming the expenditure budget to reflect changes in the seasonal staffing that would support Lagoon operations in its traditional format. But we are recognizing that the fixed costs for personnel, full-time personnel that are in part assigned to the Lagoon, uh, both on the maintenance and recreation side are still in the budget and are still drawing against the budget. So. Um, and Harbor Commission had this question too. It seems odd with the facility largely closed that we would run that kind of an expense, but really that expense reflects full-time allocated staffing to the lagoon budgetarily. It doesn't really reflect operations. It's more of a fixed cost for us. In order to save that, we'd have to take the step to do something more dramatic with those full-time employees. Okay. So if I'm reading this right, that the operations costs, those sticks are running around $268,000 a year. Is that correct? Well, and let me see, is that number in here? Uh, this is package of 31, yeah. Yeah. Is that what? Okay. So that's over the next 12 months to run Seaside Lagoon. Those are fixed. There's nothing we can do about that. Yeah, it's actually, and it's beyond this. If you go to the mini financial, a better place to start is if you go into the financial summaries tab and you look at uh, page... 41. 41. Thank you, Marnie. Uh, what you'll see is the core budget um, breakdown of costs. So you'll see entrance fees of 661,000, that's the total revenue. And then you'll see expenses, programmatic and maintenance, as well as ISF, some other charges totaling 535,000. Some of those expenditures are fixed costs because they're full-time employees that in part support the lagoon and in part have other responsibilities. Some of those expenses are for seasonal staff that come and go based on the nature of operation. We're able to shed the seasonal staff, but we're retaining in order not to lay off uh, the costs associated with the full-time staff that charge to that facility. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll, re I'll uh, review that. 
uh, more in debt. Uh, the last uh, decision package uh, would be uh, decision package number 14. Uh, it's decommissioning three vacant police officer positions. Um, I guess before we, uh, is, are those three positions we know, do we, are they okay without them or has, what's, what's the police feeling? Like, do, do we need those three spots? Well, I mean, look, no, none of these cuts, if you ask public works, you ask library, yes, but nobody wants to cut positions. They, they, they clearly not. <laughs> In terms right. of the acceptability of it, it yes it's it's acceptable to the association um again not desired but acceptable and i and i think the the reason it is from management staff's uh point of view and the reason we're recommending it is we we are able to hire and operate and meet traditional staffing complements with a number that is less than the full-time equivalent budgeted figure even with the three cuts by way of the work we've done in uh, eliminating from our books, if you will, long-term uh, dis disability or injured officers who cannot report to work, uh, or and also by way of being very aggressive in our recruitment and hiring practices, we have more healthy officers reporting to work in uniform than ever before, even with the 3D authorizations that will remain the case. So we're comfortable with it. We'd rather not do it. If we could afford it, we certainly wouldn't be in this position. We wouldn't be recommending it to you. But in order, and this gets back to this budget hangs together collectively, every department taking a bit of its fair share. Um, each department's impacts are unique. Um, but the police department is our largest budget. It's our largest expenditure in the general fund. And... Um, you know, for, for us to draw off and, and save money in that area, this, this in our view, is the most practical uh, recommendation. Okay. Um, okay, that's, that's it for me for right now. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Wynn. Thank you. Uh, I have a few items, please, Marnie and uh, Mike, that I wanted to ask about and, and ask uh, my uh, colleagues here on the commission on uh, decision package 25 the internal audit services contract for Moss Adams. I know we still have some uh, deliverables outstanding. Um, you described the $100,000 reduction as an ongoing reduction. Uh, what I think I would uh, prefer is that it was a uh, one-time one time. Uh, reduction. Uh, the reason being, uh, in part, uh, they provided a lot of really important data and done a lot of work, a lot of heavy lifting that we don't want to go a few years down the road and try and recreate. Um, there are parts of the reports that have come back that the staff is currently working on implementing and will be probably working on implementing over the course of the next year. Uh, so maybe if we take a one year pause uh, and look at it that way, that way we are continuing the relationship, but we're just taking a one year pause. And it doesn't mean that in the subsequent fiscal year, we can't say, it, we're still not going to do this again, but um, just just as a message to the council, in my opinion, to indicate that we feel like this program is an important program, that this program is a, a program that's worthwhile to uh, to pursue, and we thought it was a great idea for the staff to bring it to the city. Uh, I think maybe we just send the message. We like the idea of of maybe taking a pause for a year and continuing to work on the items that came through. Uh, but maybe to revisit it in a year. And yeah, uh, see, um, you could you could sorry. certainly make that recommendation, um, and and that is uh, for purposes of the 2021 budget. That doesn't have any any impact. It, it but it does. Uh, it sets as you said. It, it it would then return in going into 21 22. We would have to then take a subsequent action. And and yeah, it, that's uh, a reasonable message given the commission's involvement in this. And, and we could certainly articulate that to council. Really what it's saying is if we can afford it in 21, 22, we'd like to see us do another phase of, of auditing is, is really what you're saying. Okay. I would support that change. Uh, Mr. Deals, did you want to weigh in there, please? Yeah, I think that's consistent with the intent of the recommendation is that this is a suspension, not a cancellation. And then to, uh, however, uh, to Commissioner Woodham's earlier comment about what is the recovery going to look like, 
um, and sort of related to Mel Sample's comment about uh, looking things in a vacuum. We really want to look ahead at maybe what the next budget year will actually look like and to what extent the recovery will uh, will be full or partial going forward. So if we're talking about deficit spending or suspending certain operations, um, I'm not sure that we can assume that a year later our next budget's going to be completely full. Um, so the suspension of this item, you may want to request it again and one more year. The intent is not to cancel this. This is really a best practice. It's, it's rarely done. Um, it should be a trend that happens in all cities. Um, and we can be a leader in this regard, but uh, we got to get through these hurdles first. Gotcha. Uh, I think uh, just the way that it was framed there is an ongoing reduction. Uh, seemed to send a message that it would, this would be perhaps the, the end of the program. And so maybe just um, relating that uh, desire as you're describing. Um, obviously, we don't know what's going to happen in a subsequent year, but if we could bring it back to definitely bring it back. Um, yeah, if we look if we look back to the many years ago that uh, Moss Adams started and they did their initial study of the internal controls and learning learning about the city's operations and all the time the staff has put in, uh, we certainly don't want to um, to sacrifice all that on a permanent basis or get too long of a hiatus before they come back, if at all okay. possible. Commissioner Samples, you have your hand up. Um, thank you. Um, ju just for purposes of discussion, and and I agree with uh, with where this discussion is going. But but just for a thought, um, trying to demobilize and then remobilize an operation like this and stay engaged and, and keep track of changes that are going on can be extremely difficult. So um, I, I guess from a budget standpoint, I, I have to completely agree with the idea of um, suspending this for a year. At the same time, my reality brain says, is there a way to reduce their level of service and keep them engaged? Um, I, I just for sake of discussion. I can add to that. Look, they, this is what they do professionally. We're not the only city they serve. Um, I think they can re-engage pretty regularly. The challenge might be if there's significant staff changes at the city itself within the city organization that they might have to come up to speed at a later date. But from the, you know, the professional nature of Moss Adams, I don't think they would have trouble reengaging. No, no, I'm, I'm just thinking about um, their visibility into our operations and, and the changes that happen over time and being able to, to remobilize. I, I appreciate the, the, the comment. Okay. Uh, any other commissioners uh, would like to weigh in on uh, decision package 25? Uh, it seems like the idea would be then to um, let the council know, uh, please, Marnie, uh, we'd like to see if this is something that is not funded for the current fiscal year, that it's a one time or a suspension, as uh, Steve Deal said, uh, and considered for the subsequent fiscal year. Does that seem like a yeah. fair assessment of what's been said? We can, we can do that. Okay, let's uh, please go ahead and do that for decision package 25 then. Uh, for decision package, let's see here. Uh, so that was a one-time reduction. For a decision package, um, uh, 19, the, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, that was uh, the contract services. I'm, I'm not look, I'm looking for it now. There's an auditing service that's being recommended to be uh, eliminated for the uh, harbor. Yeah, is that that's... an audit of our leases? Is what 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 is it that 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 program or that service provider offers? Yes, we we have a um, we have a fairly systematic uh, auditing program where we bring in a contract uh, provider to look at various master leases, look at their history of payments, make sure that their books and their payments jive with our uh, lease terms. And we don't do every lease every year. Um, this, this decision package would reduce funding, contract funding available for paying for that service. So 
Um, again, and it clearly wouldn't be a permanent change. This would be a more of a suspension. Uh, we just wouldn't uh, effectuate audits uh, of our, our leases this next fiscal year. Well, one, one of the recommendations of the Moss Adams Report or observations of the Moss Adams Report was that perhaps our uh, auditing of third party vendors was not, uh, was not our strongest suit and we wanted to try and uh, work on that or clean that up a little bit. So if we had a contract provider that was reviewing what we were collecting in the harbor, uh, I just don't know uh, if, they, if they found examples of situations where, hey, you need to clean this part of it up or they've pretty much been stamping and saying everything looks great so far. You know, typically what happens, it's, it's in a, call it, you know, let's put the lease revenues into say four buckets. They'll find that Bucket A uh, was overpaid, bucket B was slightly underpaid, bucket C was about right, and bucket B was about right. It, it, it tends to identify um, maybe lease misclassifications, maybe descriptions for the sub lessee revenue that they accrue, percentage rents might be, might be marked one way and should be marked another way or categorized another way. It identifies things like that on occasion, uh, it's on some occasions it's identified actually in the lessee's favor that they've overpaid the city based on their own accounting. In uh, other times, maybe they owe the city uh, a bit of a catch up. Um, but you know, it's been an effective program. We certainly want to continue to do that. Uh, it's just given our resources there, particularly at Uplands and Thailands, it's a year where uh, we're a little concerned about writing that check. Okay. Um Item number um, 23, I'm going to go ahead and um, ask about, and I don't think that, I think I'd like to go ahead and advocate for everyone here on the Budget and Finance Commission. Uh, it's a recommendation, budget uh, response, excuse me, uh, decision package 23, to have all the commissions go, accepting harbor and planning to every other month. Uh, in our discussions last week, uh, that would be accepted for the Budget and Finance Commission during those times when we were discussing the budget and at mid-year, if I remember that correctly, Marnie? Where we might right. have and so what we've done in past years where um, we were on an every other month schedule, um, we would adjust the um, Budget and Finance Commission schedule. So they still met six times a year, but it wasn't every every other month. It coincided with the reports that you generally look at and the um, input you usually provide. So in effect, you'd load up, Commissioner, you'd load up in during CAFR, you'd load up at mid-year and you'd load up for budget in a way. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at a time when we're uh, having a lot of financial upheaval, uh, significant uh, debt, uh, significant reduction in revenues. Uh, I would think we'd want our Budget and Finance Commission uh, going forward to be available to review that uh, on a monthly basis without having to ask the council to call a special meeting of the Budget, Budget and Finance Commission. Uh, it provides a certain level of certainty for the commissioners that they know that they would be meeting every month and uh, we'd be able to get a quorum and, and have everybody there and prepared. Uh, I'm um, uh, never short of amazed at all the questions, the good questions that are brought by members of the commission. So uh, my, my thought would be that we would join the Planning and Harbor Commission and continuing to meet every month, but I'd like to hear what the other commissioners have to say about that. I agree. I think 12, 12 meetings a year is uh, uh, with issues such as we're facing now and are likely to be facing uh, is reasonable. And uh, there's a lot of talent. Uh, a lot of the rest of you guys have a lot of talent that uh, can be brought to bear on this. So I'd, as a taxpayer and a citizen, I'd like to see you meet. Okay. Um, Mr. Samples? Yes. Uh, first of all, based on, on the, the um, calendar that we have, I'm not sure we can do our job with, with any degree of proficiency um, unless we meet much more regularly than every other month. At, at the worst case, I would be willing to um, step up to the 15% uh, budget reduction 
It's not exactly, uh, but if you do a little bit of rounding, that means we would cut out one meeting a year, um, possibly two. But for the most part, I think we need to be meeting regularly. Um, it's hard enough to get this information in a timely fashion, formulate a response, and, and prepare it and deliver it to the city council to do our job otherwise. Okay. Would any other commissioners like to weigh in there? Yeah, I'd agree that we would we should consider um, budget finance to be included to uh, planning and harbor. Okay. Concur. All right. Mr. Wynn. I agree. Okay. So we'd I'm like to make that recommendation uh, to the council for decision package 23 that the well, budget and finance commission or request of the council, I should say uh, that the budget and finance commission continue to meet on a, a monthly basis. And that you be accepted from the every other month. Are, is the commission's recommendation that the, the the package pertaining to the rest of commissions continue to be advised? Uh, I would agree with that. Yeah. So I, the way that it's been described uh, for Harbor, uh, Harbor Commission, Planning Commission, and Budget and Finance, and the other commissions meeting uh, as as recommended in the budget, uh, the uh, decision package 20. Okay. 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 Uh, we go with that, Marnie. Um, for, um, and I know that uh, uh, Mr. Johnson's short on time. Um, I'm trying to address the ones that I think he'd want to weigh in on uh, beforehand. Uh, decision package 44. So for the vehicle replacement uh, schedule, uh, the the Harbor Patrol, excuse me, the Harbor Commission had a recommendation to uh, to alter this vehicle replacement uh, decision package 44 uh, to recommend a one-time uh, change to it. Uh, the Harbor the Harbor Commission recommended a 50 percent, I think it was, uh, rather than 100 percent. Uh, I'm just wondering if any of the commissioners would like to weigh in because the vehicle replacement fund is something that we've dug into before. Uh, if you have any comments on decision package 44. And if I could interject just briefly, Commissioner, the, the one thing to be clear, and I, I think there might have been something lost in translation at the commission meeting, their recommendation is actually exactly what the decision package proposes to do, where whereby we are we are taking what would otherwise be uh, a one-year uh, deferral of allocation to the vehicle fund and, split, and splitting it into two payments and two years of savings this fiscal year and then in 21-22. So, uh, and, and not being at the meeting, I can't say for certain, but in, as follow-up, uh, that is effectively what the decision package does. It's consistent with their recommendations. So, um, certainly feel free to talk. Let's, we will answer whatever questions we can. I just want to make sure everyone understood that there, there isn't actually a deviation in thinking there. I don't think, thank, thank you for the clarification, Mike. Um, my suggestion or my idea would be to adopt this package, but I think it's, it's a, an important item to emphasize, uh, for the council to say that this is something or a practice that we think is a good idea in this case, uh, extending life and uh, accepting the staff's recommendation to emphasize uh, our, our feeling of importance for this particular item amongst the 47, is it? <laughs> amongst the 46 other items that the council is going to discuss. So I had this one that I thought was a good idea and wanted to try and emphasize. Would uh, any other commissioners like to weigh in on that? I don't see any hands raised. I'd like to then make the recommendation and ask your opinions uh, to uh, request of the council to amongst the decision packages to be adopted that we do recommend adopting decision package for, uh, 44. Chairman Solomon, we have one more e-comment if you'd like me to read that. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Mark Hansen, regarding decision package number 24, elimination of special event fee waivers, the Harbor Commission agreed with this recommendation but requested that the city council 
make this a one time rather than an ongoing action, allow for an event by event review of the decision should revenues rebound more than, than anticipated, and exclude the Christmas boat parade from the decision package. Note that the boat parade has traditionally received a blanket waiver of fees up to $2,000 that has just barely covered the amount, almost $2,000 in potential fees. I suggest that the Budget and Finance Commission consider a similar recommendation to the City Council. That concludes the comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you to Mr. Hanson. So that was decision package number 24, the elimination of uh, event fee waivers. Now, these are the signature events, uh, Mike, is that accurate? You're on a um, mute, Mike. It is accurate. Oh, thank yes. you, Marnie. Thank you <laughs> it very is, much. and you'll recall historically, uh, we, we didn't always place a dollar amount by event. More recently, we've assigned vers, uh, via budget response reports specific waiver amount or not to exceeds, if you will. Um, this would effectively cease any contribution to special events for the fiscal year. Well, I'm a big fan of the boat parade. I'm a big fan of the special events that we have in the city. Um, I uh, attend the boat parade every year and donate to the boat parade every year. Uh, I would tend to agree with Mr. Hansen's comment. And uh, if that was the message that was conveyed by the Harbor Commission, that this be a one-time uh, pass that funding or the waiving fees for the uh, special events, uh, I would certainly be in favor of that and willing to listen to what the other commissioners have to say. Okay, so uh, Mr. Chan, did you have something? Uh, so not seeing anything uh, from the other commissioners, I would then, uh, in a similar vein, recommend the adoption of decision package or request the adoption of decision package 24 with the idea that it was a one-time, um, one-time that we eliminated the, or we, uh, we did, we no longer, it's a double negative. The one time that we're waiving elimination of special event fee waivers, that it be revisited in the subsequent years to offer the fee waivers again. Without objection? Okay, no objections. Uh, if you can please uh, make that recommendation for us, Martin. For item, um, Eugene, did you want to get back to your last decision package? I don't think you finished that, that one up. Uh, was that um, vehicle replacement? Vehicle replacement. I think, uh, thank you, uh, Mike. Um, so I, I would like if the commission is in agreement to go ahead and uh, request that the council adopt that decision package number 44. Uh, and if there's any objections uh, to have uh, the commission please weigh in at this time. Without objection, if you could please in include that, uh, Marty. Will do. Thank you. Uh, for decision package eight, um, Eleanor, if I could ask you to please weigh in. Um, the reduction uh, there, is this some um, additional staffing that was put on from the task force? Or um, if you could just um, explain, this is, a re this is your contribution or your department's contribution towards the 15% reduction? Um, yes, this is, uh, well, one of the positions got um, is defunded. So um, it was not funded last year. And then this year, um, it's reducing some of that money from our my part time, and then I'm cutting down, you know, training and postage and office supplies to try to meet that 15 percent. Okay, thank you, thank you for explaining that. I wasn't sure if that was related to somebody that was no longer we no longer had a need for it with the task force, and it was a natural attrition, or it was specific um, that it was vacant as you described. Yeah, it was a vacant. Okay. Uh, there was um, decision package 25. We talked about the auditing services. Um, uh, 
Okay. Uh, those were all of the items that I had uh, with regard to the decision packages and the budget at this time. Um, is there anything else that the commissioners have thought about or considered subsequent to uh, their opportunity to speak earlier and now their their discussion, uh, future further discussion needed? I think the only thing is given the situation where we are with COVID-19 and just the budget um, challenges that it's going to be challenging for the minimum next two years. So, you know, we, we make changes, recommendations. It's still going to be ongoing and it's going to be tough decisions ahead for everyone, unfortunately. So it's just Very true. Uh, would it be appropriate or would any of the commissioners want to weigh in on the idea of uh, Marnie had mentioned something earlier about uh, there have been things that we discussed, such as the transaction use tax. Uh, I believe that they went ahead and they, the council, please correct me if I'm wrong, Marnie, did they go ahead and approve the change to the landscape and lighting district uh, to put that out to a, a vote? No. No. They did not approve that. No. Okay. Uh, but we've, re and one of the decision packages here is a reduction in the landscape and lighting uh, supplement from the general fund to $750,000. Correct. Okay, Mr. Samples has his hand up, please. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just kind of thinking in general and in the interest of, of our time and the city council's time, we're kind of down to the 11th hour in getting a budget passed. Um, as, as a general comment that I might suggest to the, that we would make to the city council, is we've got a couple of uh, budget items where we've come up with exceptions or, or alternative methods. Beyond that, I think we should recommend that they accept all of the decision packages on the condition that immediately after July 1st, there is a task force group or whatever the, the council would like to put together that would then continuously work on how are we dealing with this budget efficiently in order to make sure that we're dealing with the changes as they occur. Because right now we're trying to forecast what might happen in the third third quarter and fourth quarter. Um, based on our typical financial calendar, um, there's no real method to deal with those changes. And I, I would like to see a, a real time organization that can make recommendations back to the council. And, and um, you know, certainly with, with city management input and and, and management of that, but so that we can move forward with this because this happens to be one of those years I don't think we can lock down a budget and then wait until November to see what happened last year and wait until March to find out what we're doing this year. If, if What's I, your recommendation, Mel? I'm sorry, go ahead, please, Mike. If I could just add one, you all to me structurally are in probably the best mm -hmm. position uh, to help with that oversight. Um, rather than form a separate task force, you have a relationship with staff, you have an understanding of our fundamentals, you've reviewed it. As a, maybe a slight alternative to that suggestion, maybe what you might suggest to council is that perhaps we present to you uh, maybe a, a quarterly update or a, and maybe we don't have to do it all four quarters because um, you already get one in mid year and fourth, but perhaps first quarter in particular, we come back to you at your that'd be your September or October meeting with a review of kind of our current status, how we're performing. I just think bringing a task force on and trying to educate them, you've, you, you've got fundamental understanding. I mean, to, to Commissioner Woodham's point earlier, you, you, have some under, you have some knowledge of our fundamentals. Bringing a group up to speed and trying to get them to be constructive in a short period of time, I just don't think is, is going to be real possible. So I'd rather, if you're going to make that kind of suggestion, as maybe part of your suggestion to meet every month, that in addition to every month that you ask that staff work with you on a first quarter review of kind of status, revenue status, performance status, how are we doing as maybe an early check-in rather than waiting until mid-year to have our first review. Uh, just as a friendly suggestion, um, just because I think you're better equipped than a whole new group that we've got to get to know and work with it. I think this is happening too quickly for us to really bring somebody, a group like that up, up to speed. Right. And, and I was 
I guess the reason I was thinking a separate task force or a separate group or, or tactical unit is so that it would be much less formal and, and there could be a much faster exchange of information in order to be able to adapt to the changes. That's, that's all I was really looking for. I think if um, I, I agree with uh, 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 Mr. Wazanski and we could maybe have the staff bring in front of the commission some sort of a mile post or a, a, a mile marker if that's okay with uh, with Marnie and and the workflow that she has uh, for the staff who are or certainly overwhelmed um, if they can bring us in uh, some sort of mile post to let us know what's going on how we're doing are we ahead of what where our estimates and projections were or behind our estimates and projections, just an idea so that maybe we could uh, recommend some actions uh, for modifications or changes at that point. Uh, would that be something you'd be okay with, Marnie? We can do that. And yeah, during these times, we certainly need to be doing it internally anyway. So it would just be sharing that information. Okay. And Commissioner and Chun, you have a question, please? Yes, I agree with, uh, with uh, Mr. McWitzang. With Zansky, Mike, um, just on a quarterly basis, first and third third quarter. It's just you know, staff gets the numbers every month, so just yeah. quarterly should be fine. It's just a, and like you said, it, it takes time to get people up to speed in terms of understanding this. And you know, we've got we've got the commissioners, and you've got staff, and we've got a good working relationship. So. Yeah, okay. I just think you're you're the right group for it, and um, and yeah, as as Marty points out, we, we plan to be very uh, vigilant in monitoring revenues. You know, we our practice in good years is you know kind of a quarterly check in, and we're kind of looking at it. I, I'm sadly, and Marty probably won't be thrilled to hear this. Is she and I will be talking about <laughs> revenues on a much more frequent basis than that uh, next fiscal year. So. Yeah, I think it makes sense for us to kind of get you a status update at, at, at the right time uh, early in the fiscal year. So we'll expand uh, as that that could be a, a supplement, a supplement, a reason why we're hoping to meet uh, as budget and finance on, on, a, on, on a monthly on a basis. basis. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. Okay, so uh, if that's all right with you, then Marnie is a supplement to that that portion of our request in that regard to the council. Right. Okay, that's great. Uh, Mr. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I am going to sign out at this point. Uh, I want to thank everybody for a great meeting. Hopefully by the July meeting, I'll be back on a normal uh, work schedule. Uh, but as of now, I've got an early morning briefing with our CEO and um, got to be prepared for that. So okay. thank you, everybody. Thank you for your input tonight. Uh, uh, Mr. Samples, uh, Mal, did you want to, before we conclude our discussion, with regard to these decision packages in the budget, did you want to revisit and weigh in on decision package 15 and make a recommendation to adopt in whole and or in part that that uh, decision package? Or does anybody else on the commission want to weigh in on that particular decision package we spoke about earlier? Uh, I think I've said my piece and, and if the rest of the commission agrees, then I think we should do something with it but um, it, it's, it's a complex problem. And um, I, I think this is a, um, an attempt at a simple solution for a complex problem. And I, I would like to see some more work done on. So perhaps the answer, and, and certainly because it needs a, a modification, it would require a, an MOU modification. Uh, the idea would be that uh, we recommend or would request that the city uh, or the council members uh, review if there's another alternative or to review this alternative and see if there's a way of, of um, avoiding downsizing or uh, in any way hampering, uh, it's not really downsizing, um, to, to more closely review decision package 15, that we have some additional questions and we ask that they look at it with a greater degree of scrutiny. Would that be fair uh, assessment of what you're saying or asking? That works for me. At this point, um, like I said, we're in the 11th hour. Um, I'm sure that a year from now, we're going to look back on a lot of these decision packages and go, oh my goodness, what were we thinking about? 
Um, this is going to be one of those, no matter what the decision is. Uh, but I, I would hope that they would give it much more scrutiny and find a better way, if at all possible. Uh, of course, this is a zero-sum game, right? If, if we add to the fire department, somebody else loses. And, and that may be just as bad or worse. Okay. Is that clear as mud, Marnie? I think so. So is it the um, full um, decision package or um, just the firefighters and the um, truck staffing? Because you, there was an option that mentioned about um, the um, admin specialist. Yeah, I think the, the question is uh, specifically about the firefighter rather than the admin specialist. Okay. Is that a fair assessment, Mel? Yeah, I, I'm mostly concerned about the fire department's face to the community. Um, the admin specialist is probably just as important as one of the firefighters. Certainly. Um, but uh, if you've got to make that choice between who responds um, to the citizens in the community, whether it's a fire or medical emergency or traffic accident or anything else, I guess I would have to lean towards the, the field personnel. Okay. I would agree with that. Do we have any other comments on decision package 15 from the other commissioners? So without objection, if that's uh, okay with you, Marnie, we'll uh, ask um, the council to consider that recommendation. Uh, one more question about decision packages uh, for me, please. Uh, decision package 22, is that decision package also going to require an MOU uh, amendment? Give me one second to refresh my memory on. Yeah, it. no, it, it doesn't. It's okay. It's just trying to um, bring the budget uh, more in line with actuals. Yeah, it's, okay. it's more of a sort of a uh, budget f philosophy, if you will, um, where we're drilling into detail and focusing on historic averages rather than budgeting towards the extreme benefit potential. Okay, yeah, it was just uh, when I looked at it, I thought perhaps it would. Thank you for clarifying. Well, if that's all the budget discussion, then um, I would ask uh, Marnie, this is going to be as part of a budget response report rather than a letter to the, from the commission, correct? I think so with the timing we have. So right. um, we need to finalize the agenda tomorrow. Um, so my thought is put these into a um, budget response report and I'm thinking, um, Run it by you as the as the chairman. Okay, I'm perfectly okay with that. Is a budget response report rather than a letter? Is there anybody on the commission that would object to doing it in that manner? Okay, so let's please do it that way, Marnie. It'll uh, certainly simplify things. Okay, and I think uh, agree to be the most efficient way of doing that. Okay. Uh, so then, um, Eleanor, please go ahead. If you have uh, a question. Um, so uh, I don't know if there was a motion and a second. I was just going to ask for that. Oh. If someone has a motion to uh, receive and file um, the uh, budget and the capital improvement uh, budget and making the recommendations that we've memorialized here tonight and forwarding off to the city council. Do we have a motion for the same? So moved. And a second? Second. Okay, we'll go ahead and do a roll call vote, please. Uh, Commissioner Samples? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Chun? Aye. Commissioner Woodham? Aye. Commissioner Wynn? Aye. And you get a yay from me. So there we go. Thank you very much, Marnie. Yes, Mr. Rosanke. Just wanted to say thank you, and I'm going to sign off. Appreciate your input. Um, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Steve, uh, for uh, being with us. Thank you, Nilesh, if you're still there, uh, for being with us. Thanks, guys. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, so next item on the agenda is a discussion of possible action regarding formation of a subcommittee to review the city CalPERS liabilities. Um, I was hoping that um, we would get done a little bit earlier. Commissioner Johnson would be available to discuss this. Uh, Marnie, I believe you have a, a report or a presentation, some information on this? Um, just barely. Um, okay. <laughs> Just that your last meeting, you requested this be put on the agenda um, yes. 
for a subcommittee to review the city's CalPERS liability. And um, if, if you did want to um, form a subcommittee, it would need to be um, two or three members because it needs to be less than a quorum. And it would need to be for a limited duration in time. And that way it does not have to um, comply with any of the Brown Act requirements. Okay, that's exactly my question. Thanks, Marnie. Uh, so um, Commissioner Chun has a question, please. Yeah, so my, my, my thoughts in terms of uh, another commission for the CalPERS liabilities is that we don't necessarily need it because the liabilities are the liabilities. The only real way to take down the liabilities is to pay it down through what we've been doing every year and basically advanced funding. And so, I mean, the liabilities are set it's by contract. There's no real simple way of getting out of it aside from, um, you know, because it's all staff based, right? And based on retirements. So um, there's no simple way out of it unless you renegotiate those contracts, which are essentially not realistic. So I, I don't think we're spending good time trying to figure this out, given that these are all based on contracts and unfunded liabilities okay thank you for that um my feeling on it was uh, to have a subcommittee to be able to go out and investigate and uh, together uh and to together discuss whether or not there are any opportunities that have come up any changes in the industry um any companies out there that help help organizations such as ours uh, find ways to mitigate these expenses that we don't know about, uh, find ways of exploring ideas that are out there. I, I don't know, I tend to agree with you that it's unlikely, but um, it, it comes up uh, often in our meetings. Uh, it's something that we don't always have a great deal of time to discuss. It seems like everyone has questions around it. So I thought perhaps if two uh, of the commissioners or a small number of the commissioners that are not a quorum uh, would be interested in uh, taking the opportunity to investigate this on behalf of the commission, to look and see if there are any alternatives out there. Have there been changes? Uh, what is up and coming? What might be something that because of the busy schedule, the staff, they haven't been able to investigate? That it would be an opportunity to do that uh, was my main thrust behind the suggestion. Uh, I would tend to agree with you that it doesn't seem like that's out there, but I'd like to at least, if there is, find out, have some ambitious people look for it. And if the end of the day, it comes back that there's nothing that's been done or can be done, then so be it. Uh, my feeling is that when somebody, uh, let's say such as, uh, such as yourself or Mr. Samples, Mr. Wynn, myself, uh, would be making inquiries, if you did it in, in in the name of or instead of as the Redondo Beach Budget and Finance Commissioner and represented it, and I'm working on a committee, um, that you might be able to get a better response out of somebody than uh, a random member of the public calling up and saying, hey, I'd like some information about this. Um, that was in part also the reason behind having the subcommittee, that they would be able to um, use that as, as an opportunity to explore with somebody who may not otherwise give them the piece up uh, the time of day. Uh, Commissioner Samples, uh, you have a question, please. Um, well, just, just kind of a comment. Um, I, um, this is on the agenda as just talking about or just being focused on CalPERS. Um, uh, Chief Kaufman was in a video webinar the other day and alluded to the fact that he's been very successful in reducing costs in our police department by uh, bringing in more and younger personnel, which affects both CalPERS and, and his workers' comp numbers. Um, those are both huge expenditures in our two primary public safety departments. And, and it appears that there are ways for the city to deal with this short of just throwing more money at the unfunded liability. 
excuse me, unfunded liability. I think it would be good to to um, look into this deeper, and and I agree that a subcommittee that's looking into these um, two areas, this goes, you know, th this touches back on so many things that we've talked about tonight. It's like the fire department talking about cutting personnel while they're already shorthanded. I don't know how all that works. I don't know what the implication is, but I think it's worthwhile investigating it in such a way that we can make good recommendations to the city council without just telling them, you need to go see how you can deal with this or without referring this to staff and, and just saying, go deal with this. Um, I, I think it's a wise idea to investigate it. And well, you muted yourself, Mel. Yes, I did. That that that's enough said. I I, uh, uh, I defer. Okay, I don't know if that's a metaphor for a bigger picture. Um, Commissioner Woodham, you had a question, please, or a comment. Yeah, I I uh, clearly think that the we need to to focus a little more on this. I don't know whether the uh, subcommittee is is a better idea than devoting a, uh, a few hours of our our time to it. Uh, one of the things that seems to me clear is that we need to, to make known or publicize the, the, the severity of those increases in costs over the next 10 or 11 years. I don't, I don't think people have a clue about how, how expensive those are going to be. We've just seen we, we're jumping through hoops to take care of a $7 or $8 million revenue reduction. And if you look at the increased expense from CalPERS going out 11 years, uh, based on the latest numbers, it averages about uh, 9 million, I'm sorry, averages 6.2 million a year for the next 11 years. So that's, that's going to be one heck of, a, of a, an issue to have to deal with. As, as, as Commissioner Chun said, there aren't many options for doing that that we know of, but uh, there, there might be uh, some ways to look at it. Uh, Cities and counties all over the country are facing the same issue and nobody has a, a, a quick solution for it. You either increase expenses or inc reduce expenses or increase revenue. Uh, and you, you got to do one or the other. Uh, some of those items and in, in what uh, uh, Marnie sent us on the latest publication talk about uh, increasing upfront contributions to reduce overall contributions. So you can, you can pay. You can pay now or pay later, but we're going to have to pay one way or the other. Uh, so we've got to come up with some some revenue to cover it, and uh, that's why I thought we should have looked more closely at, at the, the fire department issue and and even the sales tax issue. So I think we we definitely need to spend more time on this as a as a commission. I don't know whether a subcommittee is best uh, or whether we we just do it a uh, regular agenda. But we've got to focus more on it and and bring it more to the attention of, of city council. Okay, Mr. John. Yeah, so I've 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 worked with uh, pension plans for 24 years, right? And so the, the the only way to potentially take care of this, and Commissioner Samples mentioned it, is to get younger younger staff, uh, especially in the fire and police. So that's one way. The other way is we feature employees. You don't have pension plans, which, which which will not go well. So those are the answers, but it's it's uh it's the answers that people don't want to do. So, um, that's the challenge. That's the challenge. There are answers, but there's not there's not enough no good answers bill to go through it. Well, so, it, yeah, part, part of it, I suppose, is a, a concern or question. But we, we did have the person from CalPERS come in and visit with us. Um, remember, we talked about the difference between um, uh, defined contribution plans and defined benefit plans and what it would take if we decided to change out part of that. Um, the other component of the idea of having a, a subcommittee maybe looking at these things is that um, if if and when we have staff bring these things to us, um, there's a lot of uh, lot of hours that the staff is putting in to create that. So if if someone, I suppose any of us could volunteer our time and go looking around for something like that. But um, to Mr. Woodham's point, um, we I think it's something that we want to talk about. So if we could put together some of that information and and find maybe find that um, 
that golden ticket in a, in our Wonka bar somewhere, maybe it's fine. I, I don't discount and very much value uh, your experience in this regard. And uh, I don't mean to suggest that, that there's something that is, is a magical bullet, a silver bullet out there. But I thought if there were members of the commission willing to go ahead and volunteer for something like this, that we would empower them to go ahead and do that. Okay. Maybe uh, a better question would be to Marnie. I mean, would, how competitive would, would the city of Redondo Beach be going forward that new staff hired, excluding fire and police, that it would be a defined contribution plan only with a matching cut, defined contribution? What do you think the, 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 the taste is for that? My generation, it wouldn't, there wouldn't be one. The younger generation, um, I'm not sure how much they, they look towards that. I, I don't know. When recruiting, uh, uh, not something that is, is coming up, whether or not it's a, a, a contribution or a benefit plan? Marty, or, or just right. as simple, the pension benefit at all? Right. You know, if you're, if you're hiring the younger employees, I um, am not certain um, that they're looking down the road to um, their retirement plan, or are they only looking at my salary right here and now? Gotcha. Commissioner Samples, you had a question, please, or a comment? Well, well I just wanted to point out that this is a big enough deal that uh, Budget Response Report 25 spends uh, about uh, eight or nine pages talking about this and and even goes into the other question of um, considering the idea of the, the city issuing bonds in order to prepay pension liability. I, I mean, there are a lot of moving parts here and, and I think it's worthwhile to take a deeper dive into how we go about funding this thing. And, and um, It's, it's a big deal. I mean, it's, it's, it is currently a big part of our budget. And actually, if you look at the last page of the budget response report, page 195, it talks about what's going to happen in two years, just based on what's happened this year um, to our pension fund obligations. So to Commissioner uh, Woodham's uh, comment earlier, um, this is going to grow to $11 million over the next uh, 11 years. The number is going to be bigger than that, just based on the preliminary information that they've given us in the last few weeks. So I think it's a big deal, and it's certainly worthwhile us looking into. It. So um, that would be my um, my ask would be that if there were two or three members of the commission uh, to not have an issue with uh, being a Brown Act, and we said uh, when you talk about limited duration, Marnie, um, is there? Is it something where it's set where it needs to be less than a year, less than six months, less than three months? Do, do you have any guidance on that? Do you, Eleanor? My understanding yeah. is not ongoing. Yeah, it's usually under a year is what okay. it's so normally as long supposed as to be. It's recognized. So if there were two or three commissioners that were willing to uh, dedicate some of their time to uh, explore this over the course of, say, the next six months, uh, that I would want to allow to a, an opportunity to empower them to go ahead and do that and bring something back to the commission. Um, uh, the results of that deep dive, that would, that would be my ask, but we have to have two or three people willing to, as a volunteer to do that. That's and sort of a rhetorical question. Is there somebody on the commission that would be interested <laughs> in taking on that role? Yeah, I'd, 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 I'd like to be involved in it, uh, for sure. Okay. I volunteer Commissioner Johnson. Okay. <laughs> not being here uh, will not do that. Um, um, sure. Uh, the, my one question then would be, um, because this is um, uh, agendized as CalPERS only, um, are we able to expand that to include workers' comp? or does it have to be strictly related to CalPERS? You wanted to expand it to what, I'm sorry, sir? Uh, workers' comp. Uh, I, because it's on the agenda as CalPERS and it's specific to that, um, uh, you certainly could, uh, this is something I think you could vote on now or continue the item uh, for when uh, Commissioner Johnson is here. 
and uh, and see if he'd be interested in it, uh, which would be at this point, I think, um, my recommendation. I would be willing to go ahead and um, and engage on this matter. I think that it's something that um, is really important to the future fiscal health of the city. Uh, so I would volunteer my time for that, but I'd like for it to be, if we could, where everybody was here and, and made this decision together. Um, not meaning that, uh, and I think that Commissioner Johnson has weighed in on this point at times, and I'd like to hear what he would have to say about it. But this point, um, hearing and appreciating the comments, if we could, um, knowing now how this can get formed, that it can get formed and the manner in which it should be formed, um, continue the discussion for another for another meeting uh, when we have Commissioner Johnson present and all seven of us, and then make a decision about it at that time and see uh, and make uh, take take volunteers at that time if they're available. Um, I would move that we uh, continue this to the next meeting um, and uh, also amend it to include uh, discussion about whether workers comp should also be within the purview of that subcommittee or could be okay uh, i'd be okay with that uh as a second uh are there any objections to that motion okay we'll do a roll call vote then uh, commissioner samples aye commissioner chun aye commissioner woodham aye commissioner Wen. aye and I vote yes as well. Okay, our next item on the agenda are member um, items and referrals to staff. I'm sorry, Ellen. There was no a, there was no e comments on that one. I just want oh, to make beg sure. Your pardon. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Um, member items and referrals to staff. Uh, Commissioner Wynn, do you have any items for staff? No. No. Commissioner Woodham? No. Commissioner Chun? None. Commissioner Samples? No. And I have none either. Uh, want to thank everybody for taking their time tonight. I know the last couple of meetings have been longer meetings. It's budget time. And uh, really appreciate everybody coming prepared and with great questions. So at that, I will take a motion to adjourn our meeting. So moved. Second. Second. And I'm take, doing the roll call as the boxes appear. Uh, Commissioner Wynn. Uh, in favor that? of adjournment. I can't hear. Sorry, I'm in uh, favor of adjournment. Uh, voting for to adjourn the meeting. Aye. Oh, my vote. Aye. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Woodham. Aye. Commissioner Chun. Aye. Commissioner Samples. Aye. And I agree as well. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Marnie. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you.